Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, Parallel Deku, back with another fanfiction. This is the third part of, What if Deku was in love with Ibarra? Now before starting, please give this video a like, and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. The school day practically flew by before Midoriya, Takage, and Tetsu Tetsu found themselves on the afternoon train heading over to Saitama Prefecture. Nothing worthy of note happened besides a rather lengthy literature lecture by Cementos that still left the three of them reeling from the absolute overload of information. From what they had been told, they were going to have a joint session with 1A at the USJ the next day. So at least there was something to look forward to. So, what do you think we'll be doing tomorrow? Tetsu Tetsu inquired. No clue. Takage shrugged. Since the USJ is back up and running after the break-in, I'm guessing it will be some rescue training. I bet you guys are looking forward to that, huh? You bet your ass I am this is going to be our first real rescue work lesson since coming here. I like combat training and all, but this is the kind of stuff I've been looking forward to. Yeah, Midoriya agreed. I wonder what class 1A is going to be like though. I bet they are still pretty pissed that you guys caused their whole class to fail that team building exercise you told me about. The silver-haired team thought, hey, I'm pretty sure that most of them are over it by now. If anything they did really well on all the other stuff. But you can't really plan on an ambush going your way. Especially with Izuku here. She joked, causing the boy to blush a bit. You got that right. Tetsu Tetsu laughed. You know Midoriya, I heard some third years talking during lunch and you've gotten pretty popular lately. Apparently one of the big three keeps talking about you. Oh, you must mean that Hadu chick. I heard that she was one of the top students in school. Really Midoriya raised an eyebrow at that. This was his first time hearing about it. You better be careful dude, or someone here is going to get jealous. Tetsu Tetsu smirked with a sharp glance over to his friend. You know what, you might be onto something there metalhead. What if he's really into older women oh no, how have I not seen it until now I never even stood a chance. I mean you should see this girl, her s are enormous. Takage teased while giving a look of mock surprise. This is so awkward. Midoriya internally deadpanned. Speaking of Sue should see Ayuraza's hero costume. I get that her quirk requires exposed skin and all but I'm pretty sure she might be some kind of exhibitionist. It can't be that bad. Dude, that thing leaves almost nothing to the imagination. Well if it's for her quirk you can't really blame her. It's kind of the same with Kayama when you think about it. The steel quirk user pointed out. Yeah you have a point. The girl shrugged. Watching this interaction, Midoriya had to wonder if Tetsu Tetsu had developed some type of immunity to the girl's antics. He knew that they had been friends for a while so it wasn't a surprise that he knew how to roll with the punches. Maybe he should ask the guy for pointers on how to get her to stop teasing him so much. Eventually the three teens departed the train and split off from each other. Midoriya offered Tetsu Tetsu to join them out of politeness. But the silver-haired boy declined since he needed to catch up on homework. See you tomorrow have fun on your date the boy called out to them loud enough for a few passers-by to give them some curious glances. It's not a, try not to fry your brain studying. Metalhead Takage cut Midoriya off with her own quick jab. It didn't take long for the two greenets to make the journey over to the orphanage. Once the building was in sight, Takage was actually impressed by how nice the place looked. It was your standard, three-story apartment-style building attached to a small park and playground. In her mind she was expecting something a bit different. But it was reassuring to know that all those kids didn't live in some rundown dump. Hey, Takage some. Midoriya looked at girl sternly. Hmm, I know this is going to sound kind of weird. But when we get in here, can you not use your quirk if you can help it well? Can you just not talk about quirks altogether? He asked. The girl was about to say something but held her tongue. It wasn't a major request and it made total sense. If everyone living there was quirkless, then it was probably a sore spot for them. And it probably wasn't a good idea for her to use her powers around people who would never get them. Yeah, I understand. I know how to show some restraint. Thank you. He smiled at her. Once the two were in front of the building, Midoriya knocked on the large wooden door. The duo waited for a couple of seconds before it opened, revealing a young-looking woman with blonde hair and blue eyes. She was dressed in a knee-length, blue sundress and had her hair up in a bun. Ah Midoriya-kun, you're here the woman greeted in a soft tone, similar to the way Shizaki spoke. And this must be the friend you told me about. Hello Kasesan. A boy gave a polite bow, causing Takage to follow suit. This is Setsuna Takage, she's one of my classmates. Hello, thank you for letting me come here. I know it was kind of last minute and I hope it's not too much of a bother. The girl said in a polite tone. Takage typically wasn't one for formalites, but she knew when to reel it in. Oh, it's no trouble at all. We were actually pretty excited when Midoriya-kun told us he was bringing one of his friends along to help the children study. I'm grateful that you're taking the time out of your busy schedule to help us out. Well, thank you for having me. Gosh, where are my manners in Mikikakasai? I'm one of the staff members here. It's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise, so, who all is here? Midoriya asked the woman. Pretty much everyone except for the high schoolers. Most of them are off doing their own thing, but Sasuke-kun is here. Really? Yes, he's in the library helping some of the younger kids with their homework. 
He had the day off from work today so he could get ready for that science presentation of his. You can head on in and join them if you like. Thank you. Midori bowed once again as the two walked through the door. Once inside, Takage took the chance to take in the overall decor. The place wasn't extravagant by any means, but was definitely a lot nicer than she expected. The main lobby pretty much looked like one giant living room and the kitchen area seemed decked out. Wow, this place is pretty nice. The girl absent-mindedly said aloud. Yes, Kasai nodded. The building is only a few years old and most of the furniture was donated by local businesses and people in the area. The director wanted to make sure that the children had somewhere nice to return to every day. So how many people live here? 30 right now, most of which are around middle and high school age. Wow, was all the girl could say. The place looked like it could easily fit a hundred people with room to spare. But considering the fact that quirkless people were a growing minority it wasn't all too surprising that not a ton of people lived here. Eventually the trio came upon the library which was just one of the larger areas on the ground floor refitted to hold some bookshelves and a few tables. Like everything else, the collection was comprised of donations from local bookstores and high schools. After Kase took her leave to go get started on dinner, the two greenettes made their way into the room and were met with the sight of Anohana sitting at one of the tables surrounded by a few younger children. The pink-eyed teen seemed to be helping a few of them out with their math homework. Yo, Midori Akunyu finally showed up. The boy greeted him with a wave. Hey, how's it going? The green-eyed teen responded. Oh hey, you're the girl from the other day. How's it going? I'm pretty good. Nice to see you again. Takage gave him a quick wave. Before either of the teens could get another word out, two of the children practically leapt out of their seats and approached the green-haired duo. Both of them looked to be around eight or nine years old and had purple hair with gray eyes. Twins, huh. Umidoriasen, is this the friend that Kasesen was telling us about? While you're really pretty are you his girlfriend are you going to get married? Time seemed to slow down for Midori as a sense of dread washed over his body. In all honesty, the boy should have expected something like this to happen. But he hoped that he would at least have a chance to get settled in before something embarrassing happened. Deciding to have a bit of fun, Takage knelt down in front of the two girls and gave them both a toothy smirk. Well aren't you two just adorable? She laughed while leaning in a bit and ruffling their hair. And no, I'm not Izuka's girlfriend for now. While the twins' eyes lit up. Hey, don't go putting ideas in their head. They'll believe you and now flustered Midoriya sputtered out. Look, Midoriya's all embarrassed. One of the girls giggled. Yeah, he looks a tomato. All right, you too, that's enough. And Ohana was quick to come to the boy's rescue. It's rude to pry into other people's love lives. Now go sit back down, you still haven't finished the last page. Okay, the two twins said in unison before taking their seats back with the other kids. Sorry about them, they are kind of over the top. Don't worry about it. The girl waved off. I wasn't expecting you to be here, Anohanesen. Midoriya said to the boy. Yeah, my boss let me take the day off so I can get ready for my presentation tomorrow. I didn't really need it, but some extra preparation time is always good. You mentioned it the last time I was here. It's pretty important, right Aaron? A couple of representatives from some pretty big schools are supposed to be there. Yeah, if everything goes smoothly then my scholarship is pretty much in the bag. And I might even get to spend the summer break on my island. Oh yeah, Izuku did mention that you were some kind of boy genius. Takage pointed out. I'm really not all that much. Anohana slightly blushed and rubbed the back of his head. So what are you looking to study if you do get this scholarship? Chemical engineering. He answered. Math and science have always been my thing. That's pretty intense. I definitely couldn't see myself getting into that kind of work. The girl joked. Hey, it's not as hard as people would think. The boy waved off. He'll take your word for it. Cool, so Midoriya-kun says that you're here to help us out with tutoring right. Sure and the girl gave him a toothy smirk. Awesome, most of the kids are doing their math homework right now. I'd appreciate it if you could give them some pointers. I've never really been the best at explaining things. Lead the way boss Takage cheered as the trio wasted no time getting down to business. And then you divide by four and y'all have your answer. Takage smiled at the two twins as they worked their way through some basic division problems. Surprisingly, the girl was enjoying herself quite a bit. Sure, helping tutor a bunch of kids was not was not something she ever saw herself doing. But she was now happy that she decided to tag along. There was a strange feeling of satisfaction welling up in her chest that came along with doing such a deed. Wow you made it look so simple Takage-san. You're super smart. Yeah, you're way better at this than Sasuke. Hey, I heard that the black-haired teen shouted from across the room. Midoriya-san's lucky to have you as a girlfriend. Ash is not MMY girlfriend Midoriya blushed at the other end of the table as him and a group of middle schoolers finished up their English homework. Look, he's making the tomato face again one of the girls laughed. By this point, the boy didn't even have the energy to keep playing this game. This had pretty much been going on for the last hour and some change and had no signs of stopping. It was bad enough that Hadu thought the two of them were dating. But he didn't need the whole orphanage thinking it as well. Oh, what's wrong? Izuku is the thought of dating me really that bad oh no, my heart. Aye, I think it's been broken. Takage further egged the two on by placing her hands over her chest and pretending to be wounded. Look what you did you meaning one of the girls pointed to Midoriya with a scowl. 
Takageson, it's going to be okay. The other girl patted the lizard tail splitter user on the back. As much fun as it is watching you guys give Midori kind a hard time, it's almost time for dinner. These two have school tomorrow so they need to get going. Anohana announced. All of the two purple-haired children complained. It's okay guys, he'll be back the next time that Izuku is over here. Really their gray eyes lit up with joy. Really an equally surprised Midoriya looked at his classmate. Yeah, the girl nodded. This was a lot of fun and how can stay away from these two adorable rascals. You're the best, that I am. Eventually the commotion died down and the two greenettes took their leave. Kasai once again thanked Takage and Midoriya for helping them out and offered for them to stay for dinner. But the two politely declined seeing as it was getting late and they had to be on their way home. With one last goodbye, the two made their way out the door in the direction of the train station. Overall, Takage was glad that she helped out today. The girl may have only tagged along to see what the place was about at first. But now she could definitely see herself volunteering here a lot more in the future. Don't take this the wrong way, but that place was a lot more livelier than what I was expecting. What do you mean? I wasn't expecting it to be so cheery. When you told me that the place was full of quirkless kids, I thought it would be more depressing. That's not really the right word I want to use. But you get what I mean, right? Yeah, Midoriya nodded his head. He couldn't really blame her though seeing as he thought the same thing the first time he found himself in that building. Kaseisen and the others want to make sure that it's a peaceful environment for them outside of school and stuff. It's not really good for the kids to go home to somewhere that dampens their mood. It's really cool that you spend so much time there. Yeah. Hey, do you mind if I ask you a question? Sure. When did you finally get your quirk? Midoriya's feet stopped as he looked at the girl with a bewildered expression. Suddenly his mind began replaying every conversation that two had ever had and was wondering if he let his secret slip. Huh, Simon dude, I'm not an idiot. Takage started. It's pretty obvious that you were quirkless for a while. W what do you mean? First, Takage detected one of fingers and levitated it in the air between them. Bakigu called you a quirkless user that day in the hallway. Another finger followed. Second, you spend quite a bit of time at an orphanage specifically for quirkless kids. Third, I noticed that you have a lot of the same nervous tics as the kids that live there. Fourth, you told me that you were homeschooled back at Blizzard's agency. And I don't really see a point in doing so unless you were having problems at school. Which wouldn't make sense unless you were some kind of delinquent or you didn't feel safe there. Midoyara suddenly found himself without the ability to speak. Now that he thought about it, it was pretty obvious considering everything that the girl knew about him. Takage was probably the smartest kid in their entire class, so it was no wonder that she was able to piece things together. Of course she didn't have the full story, but there were enough pieces to come to a logical conclusion. As much as he wanted to lie to the girl, he just couldn't bring himself to do it. In doing so probably would have raised more questions than answers. About a year. Wow, really Takage raised her eyebrows. She certainly wasn't expecting that answer. The girl was by no means an expert on quirks, but even she knew that developing one so late was a rarity. Especially one as powerful as his. Yeah. Oh, alright. She nodded before continuing her way down the street. That's that's it. Yup. Seriously. Yeah. That was pretty much all I wanted to know. In not about to try and pry into your personal life, I was just seeing if my assumption was correct. Oh, now on to our next order of business. The girl turned around and smiled at him deviously. The kind of smile that promised nothing good. I think it's time we talk about my payment. Payment the boy tilted his head in confusion. Yeah, me payment for helping you out today. Of course I enjoyed coming out here and helping out with the kids and definitely plan on doing it again. But we need to talk about how you're going to compensate me for my time. W what did you want he nervously asked. Oh nothing major. You just have to take me out on a date. What? A date? You know, you and me. A casual dinner and maybe a movie or something. That kind of thing. At some point in the last few seconds, Midoriya's brain had completely shut down. The word date echoed in his mind and once again the boy had to wonder if he was in some sort of alternate reality. Maybe all those theories about real life being a simulation were true. Either that, or he was really in a coma while experiencing a very complex and elaborate dream. Because there was no possible way in hell that this was actually happening. Hey Izuku, you and their Takage tapped him on the forehead a couple of times to bring him out of his mental stupor. What? Jeez dude, is going out with me really such a bad idea? W.Y. What do you mean I think I've made it abundantly clear that I'm interested in you? You're pretty cute, a nice guy and I have way too much fun getting you all flustered like this. Plus you already said that you think that I'm cute. And you haven't exactly been rejecting my advances. This is a joke right? Nope, I'm 100% serious. The girl smiled at him confidently. Yet another few moments passed as Midoriya gawked at his classmate. Naturally he was thrown off by this, more so because of how casual the girl was being about the entire thing. How she could say all of that without the slightest bit of trepidation astounded him. To um, look you don't have to give me an answer right away if you don't want to. But I think that the two of us would have a lot of fun together. She said with a confident grin. I'm sorry, but this is just a lot. Hey I get it. A beautiful young lady just asked you on a date completely out of the blue. I don't blame you for being shocked. She teased. Tell you what, he'll let you think about it and you can get back to me whenever you want. Three don't really know what to say right now. All Takage did was give the boy a bit of a shrug. 
In hindsight, it probably wasn't such a good idea to just spring that on him out of the blue the way that she did. But why beat around the bush when she could just circumvent all the awkwardness and get it out of the way? You don't have to say anything there, Green Bean. She smiled at him while linking their arms together and guiding him down the road. Now come on, let's get you over to the train station before you burst into flames. Amidst all this excitement, their previous conversation finally caught up to him. He just told the girl that he was quirkless for most of his life and she brushed it off without a second thought. So you don't think it's weird that I just got my quirk? Oh no, it's totally weird. She shot back. But it makes a lot of sense considering how you act. Most people with super strong quirks are usually arrogant assholes, but you're the exception. And I doubt if you grew up being able to do what can you do, yeah I'd be such a cool person. Plus, it's not like I think any less of you for not having one or something like that. I guess that makes sense. Midoriya gave a slight chuckle. He had more than enough personal experience in that matter and had a hard time disagreeing. He wouldn't be surprised if the students in the other hero class thought the same about him. Once the two were finally at the train station, Takage took the opportunity to give the boy one last hug before taking her leave. The small act of affection doing its job to leave the boy a blushing mess as he made his departure. Now that he was gone, the girl finally released the tension built up in her shoulders and let out a heavy sigh. Oh god, I really just did that the greenette blushed while fanning herself off with her hands. Thankful that there was no one around to see her in such a state. I seriously need to learn how to tone it down a bit. He probably thinks him some kind of weirdo for doing that. Once the girl got herself back in order, Takage quickly made the journey back to her house. With all the excitement of the day finally out of the way, it was now time for some much-needed rest and relaxation. And there was no better cure for making yourself look like a complete idiot in front of a cute guy than powering your way through a tub of chocolate ice cream while watching some afternoon anime. I hope he gives me an answer soon. All this waiting is going to kill me. The next day at school proved to be a rather interesting affair for Class 1 BS Telekinetic Duo, mainly because it was the inaugural field test for the prototype of Yanaga's new hover disc that was created by Hatsume and Majima. Thank you for tagging along with me, Midoriya-kun, the gray-haired teen said in her usually stoic voice as the two walked into Jim Gamma. At the moment, 1B was in the middle of a free period and they got permission to try out the new equipment so long as they returned before their next class. It was no problem, young -asun. It makes sense that Yout asked me to come along. The boy gave her an honest smile and I'm really interested in seeing how you handle that thing. He looked down to the new piece of equipment. Overall, the device wasn't nearly as complex as the boy expected. It was a solid metal disc that was made up of eight interlocking plates that that could be folded in on each other. Not only could the thing be transported relatively easily, it was sturdy enough to support all of her body weight once fully extended. The group spent quite a bit of time brainstorming possible ideas that day in the support studio, one of which was a giant glider that was simply too heavy for the girl to carry around with her and after some deliberation, this proved to be the most efficient method. But the icing on the cake came in the form of the girl's new boots. Like previously stated, the main issue that Yanagi had was keeping herself attached to whatever she was riding. Since she couldn't use her quirk on herself like Midoriya could, they needed to find a way to work around that. And the solution that they came up with was a new pair of boots with magnetic soles. The polarity was strong enough that it would keep the girl attached to disc with relative ease, but weak enough to where she could dismount without any real issues. This mitigated the necessity of needing brackets to hold her feet in place. It may have only been the prototype, but it was definitely a step in the right direction. We don't have a lot of time so let's get started. Kansensei said that we only have this area for half an hour. Right. Using her quirk, Yanagi unfolded the disc from its compacted stated and locked the plates into place revealing an octagon-shaped saucer. The girl then let out a short breath as she levitated the device in front of her and jumped on it. Thankfully, everything seemed to be working well so far. This will do. Yanagi simply said, I don't plan on going up too high, so there won't be too much trouble. Okay. Midoriya nodded. The poltergeist user wasted no time in getting down to business and ascended higher into the air until she was about two meters off the ground. Midoriya followed suit by also activating his quirk and floating right next to her. With everything ready to go, Yanagi took off at a reasonable speed and began doing laps around the training area. Over the next five minutes or so, Midoriya watched the girl navigate herself through the gym with an impressive amount of skill. This may have been her first time using the new object, but you wouldn't think that with how well she was moving. Is everything okay? The grinette asked from a few meters behind her. Moving like this isn't too hard, but it will take some getting used to. However, I don't think that he'll be able to maneuver that well. I get it, him still having problems with that as well. Moving in one direction is easy, but changing directions on a dime is difficult. The boy admitted, I think I can go a bit further though. She told him. Yanagi then upped the difficulty by attempting a sharp turn around one of the stone pillars that Cementos had put up around the gym. She came pretty close to hitting the thing, but by using her left arm as a guide, she was able to clear it. Now I get why you always chose to take to the air during class. This is quite fun. Yeah. He smiled. Another few minutes passed before the girl was ready to try her next move. 
Without any warning, Yanagi suddenly changed directions and pulled the board higher up into the air. She had seen this move done by a few heroes and it seemed like a pretty good one to try. Midoriya watched as the girl quickly rotated herself before doing a corkscrew maneuver on the board. For a first-time attempt, it was pretty good. It wasn't as sharp as what it could've been, but it was still an impressive feat nonetheless. Unfortunately, Yanagi got so caught up in the moment that she didn't think it all the way through. Once she completed the trick, she brought herself back down closer to the ground, but failed to take into account the fact that Midoriya was still directly under her. Neither of the two had a chance to react before colliding with one another with enough force to send them both back to the earth with a loud thud. The sudden impact was enough to knock the disc from her feet and land right on top of her classmate. Ugh, Midoriya groaned out in discomfort. He wanted to be annoyed that his classmate didn't give him any warning before trying something so dangerous in such close proximity to him. But nothing was broken from what he could immediately tell, so all was forgiven. Are you okay, Yanagisan? Midoriya kun, what is? Quickly, the boy looked down towards where she was still laying on top of him and his almost froze once he did. The fact that they were in a rather compromising position was the least of Midoriya's worries when he tracked where Yanaga's single blue eye was starring. At some point during their midair collision, the jacket to his gym uniform had ridden up all the way to the upper part of his abdomen, completely exposing his midsection to the world. Normally, Yanaga's demeanor was calm and unchanging. But even now the girl was having a hard time hiding the look of shock that plated itself onto her face. The poltergeist user now had a completely unobstructed view of the multitude of scars that decorated his body. These are. Fear overtook Midoriya's senses as he quickly pushed her off of him and scrambled to his feet, making sure to pull the jacket down as tight as he could to hide his shame. A painfully awkward silence followed as the two looked at one another before the green-haired boy tried to remedy this situation. It's nothing he frantically blurted out. Midoriya kun, how did you get those scars? The girl's voice was unusually tense. It's an no big deal, he answered. Are you are you cut? Three need to go to the bathroom. The boy cut her off as he attempted to walk past her and make his way to the door. But he was stopped when the girl grabbed him by his arm with a rather tight grip. Let me go. No, look, it's our really no big deal. Jay, just forget that you even saw anything. You really can't expect me to do that. Yana just and I. Calm down. She flatly stated. What are you tea-talking about him tea totally calm? He gave her a wobbly smile that wasn't fooling her one bit. Midoriya kun, if you don't calm down I'm going to have to tell the teachers about what I saw. She told him. If Midoriya was worried before, he was downright terrified now. Throughout their entire time as classmates, he never once heard the girl say anything close to what could be considered a threat. She just wasn't that kind of person. And a part of him had the feeling that she was a woman of her word. Inside his mind, the boy was starting to panic. In the blink of an eye, a multitude of different scenarios were playing out in his head. And none of them were good. He wasn't too sure about U.A.'s policy on this kind of thing, and he was in no rush to find out. What would happen to him if the school were to find out about this? Would he get kicked out of the hero course? Was he going to be put into some type of holding cell? All of these possibilities were getting worse and worse with each passing second. Unbeknownst to him, his breathing became labored, his face reddened and a layer of sweat was starting to form on his forehead. Midoriya kun, you need to stop freaking out. Yanagi placed her hands on his shoulders. One reason for doing this was to try and get him to relax, but the other was to stop him from trying to run out the door. Take his ear breaths. Somehow, the green-haired teen was able to recompose himself just enough for the world to stop spinning. Sit down. You look like you're about to pass out. She ordered. Buke. He reluctantly agreed as he planted himself on the floor, with the gray-haired girl following suit. Are you okay? Him fine. Him having a hard time believing that. Him telling you the truth. He shot back, silently hoping that his words would make up for his less-than-stellar demeanor. Midoriya quickly clasped his hands together in a prayer position and bowed his head. Yanagisan, please don't say anything about what you saw. Three don't do that anymore. On Yanaga's end, she was having a difficult time herself. This was her first time ever encountering something like this in real life and she didn't really know what to do. To be frank, Midoriya was probably the last person that she expected to be cutting himself. Sure the boy didn't present himself as the most confident person in the world. But he never came across as depressed or unstable in any sort of way. The responsible side of her mind was telling her that she should report this as soon as possible. But the other had a feeling that doing so would cause more problems for the boy than he wanted right now. In all honesty she wished she never saw those cuts to begin with. But now that she did, she couldn't exactly erase it from her memory. It would've been one thing if there were only a few. But from the brief look she got, there were dozens of them. All strategically placed to avoid one another in a clean and uniform fashion which was a telltale sign that he had a lot of practice. Deciding that getting unsettled wasn't going to help the situation one bit, the girl regained her nerve and looked at him with a neutral expression. I don't really know what to do about stuff like this, but I do know that what you're doing what you did isn't healthy. Are you sure that you're all right? I'm fine. He repeated wordly. Is everything okay at home? Yanagisan, I promise you I'm completely and 100% okay. Like I said I don't do that anymore. I haven't done it in a while. Something in the back of the girl's mind was telling her not to believe that. But it wasn't like she could verify whether or not it was true. 
From what she had seen, none of those wounds appeared to be fresh, so at the very least it had been a significant amount of time since the last time he did it. Against her better judgment, Yanagi chose to accept what he was saying. But she still had her doubts. Fine, she replied after letting out a sigh. Fine, what he raised his head. I won't say anything. What? I won't say anything about this. Midori eyes practically lit up at those words and a sense of relief washed over his soul. Think. But she held up a hand to his face. Now that I know about this, I can't exactly let it go. I should report this to Hound Dog Sensei or Kan Sensei, but I won't. For now, this will just be between the two of us. Okay, is there any chance that anyone else knows about this? No. Midoriya quickly shook his head. Midoriya Kunshi glared at him. She may not have known Midoriya for very long, but everyone in the class knew that the boy was a terrible liar. Okay. He relented. One other person does. But he doesn't go to our school. And he knows that I haven't done it in a long time. How have you been able to hide this for so long one of the other boys had to have seen it by now? She asked. I usually change in the stalls or wait until everyone else has already left to switch my shirts. He answered. Well, that explained why he was usually the last one out of the locker rooms before training. The girl did find it a bit odd that it took him the longest out of all the boys to finish getting changed despite his costume being one of the most simple. Even Monoma managed to make it out before he did, and his hero costume was literally a tuxedo. Okay, thank you, Yanagisen. He'll stay quiet about this for now, but he'll be keeping a close eye on you just in case. As soon as I see something wrong, I'm going to the faculty. Okay, that's fair. He reluctantly agreed. He wasn't too happy about it, but it was way better than the alternative. Seeing as there wasn't really anything else to talk about, the two telekinesis users stood back up to their feet and Yanagi grabbed her hover disc. Soto, you want to pick up where we left off? Midori asked. No, the girl replied while folding her support item back up. I think that was enough for today. All right, he nodded. With that, the two students began making their way out of the gym and over to the locker rooms. Although Midoriya was glad that the girl wasn't going to blow the whistle on his secret, he was still uneasy about this entire thing. Having someone know about this was quite literally one of his biggest fears. He made a mental note to wear a tank top under his gym uniform in the future to avoid any further mishaps. Thank you for promising to keep this between us. I'm not really good with stuff like this. But if you ever need someone to talk to, you can come to me. If you want. All Midoriya could do was give the girl a half-hearted smile and scratch his cheek. He'll keep that in mind. That was the last thing the two said before splitting off and getting dressed. Once they were back in class, it was hard for either of them to stay focused on present Mike's English lesson. Yanagi still had a nagging feeling in the back of her head that she may have made the wrong decision. But for now, she was going to trust the boy and keep things between them. But for the time being she would make sure to keep a close eye on him, just in case. Alright everyone, gather around can announce to the group of students currently waiting to board the buses. This is going to be our first training session together with both classes. There's 39 of you, and only 4 of us. Which means there will be no room for goofing off. Today's objective is rescue training, so you need to pay attention to what we tell you. Yeirazu was the first to raise her hand. Excuse Kansen say, who will the other two teachers be? Thirteen and All Might will be meeting us at the site. The man answered. Are there any other questions Aizawa lazily groaned out, only to get no response. The 1B students couldn't help but wonder if the man was seriously like this all the time. Good, now hurry up and get on the buses. We don't have any time to waste. Right before the students began making their way into their designated vehicles, Kendu made a proposition. Hey, yeah yours Yusin, we should mix it up a bit. I'm sorry the raven-haired teen gave the other class rep a curious look. Instead of dividing the classes by bus, why don't we all just get on whichever one so everyone can get to know each other? Hey yeah, that's a great idea Itsuka Tetsu Tetsu cheered. Makes sense. Gyro shrugged. The raven-haired teen took a moment to think this over before giving the girl an approving nod. Without any hesitation, Yayurazu made the announcement and pretty much everyone agreed with the reasoning. The others didn't really care one way or the other. One beyond the students formed their own small groups and got onto the buses. The group consisting of Midoriya, Yanagi, Tsunotori and Honuki boarded the first bus. While Takage's group comprised of herself, Kendu, Tetsu Tetsu and Shizaki got on the other. The green-haired girl was going to try and join Midoriya's group, but the vehicle ended up filling up too fast to make that happen. Part of the girl was upset that she wouldn't get the chance to tease him a bit more on the ride over to the USJ. But she quickly put that aside since they were all going to the same place. It didn't take long for the mingling amongst the hero course first years to kick off. For the most part, everyone was just sticking to their usual group of friends. But that changed when Kaminari decided to officially break the ice. It's pretty cool that we'll get to join classes for this, I said the electrification quirk user to the group of students. He'll say, aside from the other day we haven't really had the chance to mingle with each other all that much. Ajiro pointed out, oh yeah I heard about your team building exercise. It sounded like a total pain in the ass. Kaibara added, hey, it wasn't too bad, just exhausting. Wouldn't doubt it. We almost made it through, but then you one big guy showed up and completely took us out. Yeah, yes yeah, sorry about that. Midori apologized. What's there to be sorry for you guys just got the drop on us and there was nothing we could do to stop it. 
Next, it was Asui's turn to join the conversation. Since we're pointing out the obvious, there's something that's been on my mind. Actually, it's about you, Midoriya-san. About me, the boy gave her a curious look. What is it, Asui-san? Call me Tsu the frog-themed girl bluntly stated. Okay, that power of yours, it's a lot like the psychic sister's quirks. You wouldn't happen to be related to them, would you? The girl's question was enough to elicit a few not-so-subtle laughs from the 1B students that were present, especially Hondaki. However, in the back of the bus a certain heterochromatic teen suddenly became very interested in this conversation. What's so funny Yeyurazu asked? Nothing, it's just kind of a running joke in our class. I don't get it. Jairo gave them a confused look. Honukikun and a few others think that Midori Kun is actually their younger brother. They've been trying to get him to admit to it all year. Yanagi stoically replied, Could you blame us though they look a lot alike and have identical quirks? Awaste joked, and Midori Kun did do his internship with Blizzard. Plus she's the one who gave him those jackets. And they definitely don't look cheap. Simon guys, Midori said in a defeated tone before redirecting his attention back towards the frog-themed girl. To answer your question Asuasan, no I'm not related to them at all. We just have similar quirks. In Omidoria, don't take this the wrong way but you're not at all like I thought you'd be. Kaminari told the green-haired boy. Huh, yeah Kaminari's right. With the way that Bakigu talks about you, we all thought that you were an asshole or something. Seriously that guy of all people is going around calling people assholes talk about the pot calling the kettle black. Midoriya-kun's actually a really cool guy once you get past the social awkwardness. Yeah, he's a total fluffball the American girl joked. Thanks to Notorisan. The boy deadpanned. Back on the other bus, the rest of the students were having their own conversation. So Takage Ishido started with a sly grin. What's up with you and that Midoriya guy? Hotakage looked up. Yeah, are you two going out or something? You looked pretty cozy after our training session the other day. Hagakure blurted out from beside the pink-skinned teen. As much fun as it would've been for the girl to tell them that something was going on between the two of them, she decided against it. Mainly because it would've been a lie but also because she knew that Midoriya wouldn't appreciate it very much. And the last thing she wanted to do right now was to ruin her chances of scoring that date. No, nothing like that. Simon, there's totally something there. I'm neither going to confirm nor deny those allegations. The green-haired girl smirked. Well, with all the shameless flirting that she does with him all the time, it's easy to get the wrong idea. Kendu joked. Hey, I just like seeing him get all embarrassed. It's way too cute. Oh, so you think he's cute, huh? Yeah, Takage stated in a way that made it seem like it was the most obvious thing in the world which was enough to throw off quite a bit. The pink-skinned girl wasn't used to someone rolling with her punches this well. It's no use, guys, Kendu said. It's tough trying to get a rise out of Setsuna. The girl's pretty much impossible to embarrass. Still, what's his deal, Kirishima asked. He's definitely not like how I thought he'd be. He's just shy. Nothing to it, really. Yeah, we could tell. In the back of the bus, a certain blonde-haired student was getting irritated by the current conversation. It was bad enough that he was going to the same school as that loser. But now he was forced to listen to these extras talk about him. No one cares about shitty Deku Bakugu almost screamed. A momentary silence fell over the crowd as everyone gave the explosion quirk user a series of stares. As expected, most of the 1B students were pretty surprised by the sudden outburst. And none of them knew how to react. However, Takage decided to have a little fun with it. So as he always liked this the grinette asked while pointing her finger at the boy in question. The girl was met with silence before looking around the group of 1A students. Takage couldn't help but notice the rather uneasy looks that they were giving each other. Are they scared of him or something she thought? Anyways before Boom Boy here interrupted our conversation. What did you just call me? Shark Teeth. Shoji, I hope you find me rude for asking. Why what's the deal with that mask? Takage continued on as if she hadn't heard anything. Don't ing ignore me you loser I don't care if you are useless Dekas girlfriend. Back you go. Sit down and be quiet I don't want to hear another word out of you for the rest of the ride over Kang quickly made his presence known as he addressed the now irritated teenager. What the boy scowled at the themed hero. Don't make me repeat myself boy. The ashen blonde teen was thrown off by the fact that a teacher had the audacity to scold him in front of other students. But he decided to take his lumps for the time being and sat back down in his seat. Bakugo angrily folded his arms across his chest while mumbling something about killing someone. Jeez Aizawa, learn to control your students. Kan thought to himself before sitting down in his own seat at the front of the bus. It didn't take long for the students to arrive at their destination. Once everyone got off the buses, they were led into the massive building that would serve as their training ground for the day. Since this was their first time being there, the 1B students marveled at how diverse the different areas were. It was no secret that UA had an absolutely ridiculous amount of funding to pay for their facilities. But this was just insane. Welcome students I hope you all are having a wonderful day. The Space Hero 13 greeted the Wood heroes. Both Midori and Takage had to keep themselves contained as they finally got a chance to meet them. Across Japan, 13 was considered to be one of the top rescue heroes in the country, so it was no surprise that they would be among the school's faculty. Today will be your first official lesson in rescue work. Please make sure that you absorb as much as you can and take this seriously. 
After a brief overview of the facility and all that it had to offer, they informed them of what they were going to be doing for the remainder of the day. Essentially, it was going to be one big round robin across the different areas. The spacesuit-wearing heroine then announced that the class was going to be split up into three groups of 13 students. What are the groups, Kendu asked, presumably speaking for everyone else. You will be divided and paired up with one of the teachers. 13 began. Group A will be going with All Might. Group B will be myself and Vlad King. And Group C will be going with Eraserhead. Towards the back of the group, Midoriya was silently hoping for two things. The first was that he would be placed anywhere but group of the second, was that he wouldn't be forced to be partnered up with Bakugou. Come young students, the number one hero made his presence known. My group will be young Midoriya, Honuki, Yanagi, Tsunotori, Asui, Takoyami, Yuraka, Ayama, Tsuburaba, Kamori, Kaminari, Minda, and Kirishima. Group B will be Takage, Kendu, Shizaki, Tetsutetsu, Bakugou, Siro, Hagakure, Rin, Shishida, Shoda, Kaibara, Jairo, and Koda. Ken followed. Great, we get to spend the rest of the afternoon with the walking time bomb. Takage whispered to Tetsu Tetsu, and the rest of you will be with me, Aizawa lazily stated. Is there any reason why the groups were formed in such a way Shishida asked? Yo, Ken answered. We all just picked names out of hat. With the teams announced, 13 gave one last warning to the students to be careful and follow all instructions. The first team to depart was Group B as they made their way over to the landslide zone. As Midoriya watched them leave, he couldn't help but feel slightly worried for his classmates. No doubt Bakugou was, going to try and make the exercise all about him and stand out as much as possible. And given his personality, he definitely wasn't going to be nice about it. But for some reason, the boy's eyes seemed to linger on Takage out of everyone. The two had barely said a word to one another the entire day and it left a weird feeling in his chest. In truth, he was still trying to wrap his head around what happened during their previous outing. The girl asked him out on a date of all things and the mere thought of that left him reeling. Although it certainly wasn't the worst thing in the world, it was still weird to even think about. Why on earth a girl like her would ask him out was a complete mystery to him. Takage was pretty, smart, likable, and outgoing. And he was not. They were pretty much total opposites. Sure, she made no attempt to hide the fact that she found him attractive and went out of her way to tease him whenever she could. But up until this point, he didn't think that she was being serious about it. Midoriya kun, you should really learn how to not be so obvious. The stoic voice of Yanagi snapped him out of his thoughts. Huh, yeah I'll have time to check out Takage Chen later. W what the boy squeaked out as his face erupted into a shade of crimson. Why Yanagi Sen, I ate that wasn't what I was doing at all. The gray-haired girl was about to respond, but was interrupted by their teacher. All right students, it's time for us to move out. But before that, you must all select a group leader. What for Tsuburaba inquired. Things can often get quite chaotic during rescue operations, and communication is key. In times of a crisis, it's good to have a clear chain of command to mitigate any unnecessary risks. Having someone in charge to direct traffic should always be one of your first steps. The blonde-haired hero explained. The students took a moment to look around at each other. Since this was a mixture of both classes, a lot of them had a hard time figuring out who would be the best person for the job. A few small discussions broke out until Yanagi made a suggestion. I vote for Honukikun. How the lipless teen tilted his head at her. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Shubiraba stated as he threw his hands behind his head. Juzo's pretty level-headed so head be good for the job. I agree. Tsunotori smiled. It settled then all might cheered. Young Honuki, y'all be in charge of the group. Fine with me. The boy shrugged with a slight smile on his face. Or at least with what everyone assumed was a smile. It was actually really hard to tell considering he didn't have any lips. With that matter settled, Groupa made the journey over to the ruins zone. Meanwhile, with Group B, him in charge Bakugou shouted towards the rest of the students. Thirteen and Kan had just finished explaining to the group that they needed to pick a leader and the blonde-haired boy wanted to make it very clear who was going to hold that position. Yeah, I don't think so. Takage deadpanned, along with a few others. What? Yeah, I think either Satsuna or Itsuka should be the leader. Tetsu Tetsu backed the girl up. That does seem like the best idea. Shizaki added, earning a few approving nods from other members of the group. Let Satsuna do it. Her quirk is good for this kind of stuff and she can get a better look at things than I can. Kendi pointed a thumb over to her class vice rep. No one had any reason to disagree with the orange-haired girl's logic so they all gave a series of nods. Fine by me. Takage shrugged. I was going to vote for Itsuka, but I guess it'll take point. All right, now that we have that settled, let's hurry on over to the training area. There's much to do and not a lot of time. Thirteen interjected. While the group continued their journey over to the landslide zone, Bakugou was grinding his teen in annoyance. This makes two times today that Deka's girlfriend decided to try and make a fool out of him in front of everyone. Needless to say, the boy was not going to let something like this stand. Once they finally arrived at their destination, Groupa wasted no time getting down to business. The ruined zone was essentially one giant cityscape that simulated a destroyed urban environment, with multiple buildings found in precarious conditions. Midoriya couldn't help but think back to his internship with Katsuragi. Although the destruction was more widespread, it gave him a very similar feeling. 
Now students, allow me to give you your scenario for this exercise All Might announced in his usually boastful manner. Urban rescue operations can be tricky to deal with considering how dangerous the environment itself can be. Across the area, there are multiple training dummies that will serve as your simulated casualties. Your jobs are to locate them, get them to a safe area, and handle any wounds that you are able to treat. You now will have free reign to act as you see fit and they'll be here to supervise and correct you as needed. Remember to work both diligently and efficiently. Is there a time limit? Asui inquired. We have this area for 30 minutes, so that will serve as your time limit, young Asui. But remember, in situations such as this, time is of the essence. The man responded. Now without further ado, you can begin whenever you're ready. With their time now started, the students huddled up into one massive group around their leader and began formulating their strategy. So, what's the plan Juzo Tsuburaba said? First things first, we need to know what we're dealing with. This area is pretty big and we can't waste time going over every nook and cranny. Midoriya-kun, Yanajichin, you guys are going to be our eyes in the sky and point out wherever the casualties are. While they are doing that, the rest of us will split up into groups of two and handle whatever you find. We have a good combination of quirks for this so it should work well. The softening quirk user explained. Sounds good to me. Kaminari smiled. Let's make sure that we don't spread ourselves out too thin if we can help it. If you come across something that you can't handle, don't be afraid to call for help. Midori Akon and Yanajichin will be an extra set of hands. Him fine with that. The gray-haired girl said. All right, boys and girls, let's get to work. Now that the plan was in place, Midori activated his quirk and began ascending towards the sky. While at the same time, Yanagi unhooked her hover disc on off the harness on her belt and unfolded it before joining him. As the telekinetic duo began scanning the area, the rest of their group split off into pairs and followed behind them. The entire ruined zone was a complete mess, but it wasn't too difficult for them to see where all the training mannequins were located. Most of them were in places that were easy to identify while a few others were in some more hard-to-reach spots. There's 15 in this area. Most of them should be easy to reach Midoriya called out to the group below them. Where are they? Honuki shouted back. The boy quickly pointed to the areas where the mannequins were located and the others wasted no time in moving over to commence the rescue operation. Down on the ground, Honuki used his quirk to sink a large amount of debris out of a clearing to create a safe zone. Seeing as their quirks weren't really the most useful in this specific type of scenario, Kaminari and Kamori decided to help him out and get the area ready to receive casualties. Midori-kun, over there. Yanagi pointed over to a mannequin conveniently placed in between some rubble about 40 meters away from them. With a quick nod, the two flew over to that location to get a better look at the damage. Fortunately for them, the mannequin didn't appear to be crushed in any sort of way. It was just sandwiched in the middle of two giant slabs of concrete and some smaller debris. Most of this stuff is too heavy for me to move. The girl stoically said after attempting to use her quirk on the rubble. It's fine, I can move all the big stuff while you grab the mannequin. They don't look that heavy. The boy replied. Midoriya took a moment to focus on the rubble and used some of his newfound knowledge to imagine a giant sphere in his mind around the area. After a couple of seconds, an absolutely massive amount of debris consisting of about 10 pieces lifted off of the ground and began floating into the air. Did he increase the amount of objects that he can manipulate the gray-haired girl silently wondered as she watched him. Deciding to think about that later, Yangi regained her focus and used her own quirk to carefully lift the mannequin out of harm's way. With their casualty now safely secured, the duo made their way back over the safe zone that was slowly filling up mannequins. Once they made the handoff to Kaminari, a voice about a hundred meters away from them caught their attention. Hey, can we get some help over here? Tsuburaba shouted. Choosing not to wait for an invitation, Midoriya and Yanagi quickly flew over to where they were needed. Once they arrived, they were met with the sight of their classmate along with Kirishima next to a collapsed building with a few mannequins that were trapped underneath a wall. You guys need some help, right? Midoriya asked. Yeah, this thing is way too big for us to move. Subiwara told him. I got a Yuraka announced as her and Asui made their appearance from around the corner. The two had just finished taking their own casualties back to the safe zone and were quick to respond to call. All that debris is in the way, he'll make it float and move them. Hold on, Midoriya shouted. How the brunette stopped in her tracks and looked up at him. You can't go moving things around haphazardly. You don't know if disturbing the scene could cause a chain reaction. That wall is being held up by some of the smaller debris. So moving things in the wrong order is going to make it fall. He explained. Oh, Yuraka said once she got a better look at the area. The green-haired boy from 1B was right. The wall was being held up by a few smaller slabs of concrete underneath it. One wrong move and the whole thing would definitely come down and crush the mannequins. So why don't we just start busting up this wall Kirishima said while activating his quirk. That would pretty much be the same thing. Asui bluntly interjected. Breaking the wall down the wrong way would also crush the mannequins, Jiro. So what do we do the solid air user asked. Midoriya took a moment to think over their next course of action. He replayed everything that he learned from Katsuragi and tried to find the most efficient way to go about this without causing them more trouble. After a few seconds, an idea popped into his head. We need to find something that's more stable than these rocks and reinforce the wall itself. Once we do that, we can start moving the casualties out of there. He'll go see if I can find some support beams to bring over here. The boy explained. 
he'll go with you, Yanagi flatly stated. Achikachin should go too, Jiro. Our quirk makes things weightless so that should make things easier for you to too. The rest of us can start moving all the smaller pieces of rubble out of the way. That's a good idea. The brunette nodded. Suddenly and without warning, Midoriya used his quirk on the girl and levitated her towards him and Yanagi. Sorry, but it'll be faster if we all fly. The greenette apologized. It's fine. Yuraka waved off before the trio went on the hunt for some of the necessary materials. A bit further down the road on top of one of the ruined buildings, All Might was watching things unfold. For being their first rescue exercise, the students were doing surprisingly well. They were moving efficiently and making rather good time. However, as much as he should have been giving everyone an equal amount of attention the man was focused on one student in particular. He still didn't know what to make of Midoriya and how this boy knew about his regular form. Tsukachi was still in the process of putting together a file on him but hadn't given the man any updates over the last few days. But the number one hero couldn't help the strange feeling that forced its way into his gut every time he looked at the boy. There was just something about this green-haired teen that didn't sit right with him. And the sooner he found out, the better. Landslide zone. All right guys, here's the plan. Takage said to her group as they all huddled together. Our best bet is to split into two teams. A search and rescue squad, and a recovery squad. Makes sense. Gyro nodded. The search and rescue squad's job is to locate the casualties and bring them back to Rally Point. While the recovery squad will be in charge of staying at the Rally Point, treating any injuries and keeping them safe. So what are the teams Kaibara asked? The search and rescue squad will be me, Ibarra, Siro, Gyro, Shishida, Kaibara and Koda. A lizard tail splitter user began explaining. The recovery squad will be Metalhead, Itsuka, Rin, Hagakure, Shota and Bakugu. With the blonde-haired boy growled a few meters away from everyone else. What's the big idea sticking me here with the rest of these extras? A collective sigh came over the group as Takage pinched the bridge of her nose in annoyance. They really didn't have the time for an unnecessary argument right now. Look Bakugu, we need quirks suited for high mobility and recon. And yours isn't very well suited for this scenario. And why not? We're in the landslide zone. The entire area is already unstable enough as it is. And the last thing we need is one of your blasts accidentally causing a chain reaction. You think I can't handle this or something he scowled at the girl. Will you give it a rest already Tetsu Tetsu deadpanned? Setsuna's right, so don't get your panties in a wad. Deciding that he now had enough of these class 1B rejects making a fool out of him, the explosion quirk user marched up to the silver-haired boy and got right up in face. You want to say that one more time, shitty eyelashes. Look, we don't have enough time for pointless disagreements. Tendu interjected. Setsuna's in charge so we have to do what she says. And her logic is pretty sound. The two boys stared at each other for a few more seconds before Bakugu turned away from Tetsu Tetsu and stomped off to a nearby area that had some stable ground. While this was going on, Kan and Thirteen were taking notes of this interaction. Jesus in Christ Takage drug her hand across her face. Setsuna Shizaki immediately chastised the girl for her blasphemous language. My bad. The girl apologized. You guys seriously have to deal with all the time, or does he just have an extra long stick up his ass today? You kinda just learned to tune him out. Gyro shrugged. Whatever, let's just get going. Takage waved her group on before breaking her body up into twenty pieces and flying over the wreckage. While the search and rescue team made their ascent up the landslide, the recovery team went over to where Bakugu was currently pouting. It didn't take long for the group to set their plan in motion. From the sky, Takage used her overhead view to locate all of the mannequins that she could easily identify. There were fifteen from what she could tell and most of them weren't hard to get to. All right, I found a few of them the girl shouted down below. Where are they? Kaibara responded. Deciding to put some of her training with headshot into effect, the girl gave a rather brilliant idea. I'm going to use my pieces and levitate them above where the casualties are and use them like a signal marker. The rest of you use it to hurry up and grab them and start hauling them back. Got it the rest of the students nodded before getting to work. Ken and Thirteen couldn't help but be impressed by this strategy. Not only was Takage using her quirk in a smart and efficient manner, she was also supervising her group's progress and giving out instructions as they went along. After about three minutes went by, they were already over halfway through securing the simulated casualties. While that was going on, the recovery team was also doing a solid job. Kendu had pretty much taken control of that group and was directing traffic while triaging and prioritizing the injuries. It was by no means perfect, but it was definitely a good start. I must say Kenkun, your students are rather remarkable. Thirteen said to their colleague, I agree, we haven't gone over rescue and recovery operations that much this semester since we focused so heavily on them improving their quirks. But this is some impressive coordination. The themed hero nodded his head. Are any of your students planning on becoming rescue heroes? As far as I know, only Midoriya and Takage have said that was their goal. But I wouldn't be surprised if a few others were to focus on that. While that's reassuring, the girl seems to have a real talent for it. I guess all that praise she gets from Kamekun is valid. Yeah, I guess so. Tian smiled. However, I can't help but feel a bit worried about Aizawa's students. I know they've been through a lot but their class cohesion is pretty bad compared to yours based on what I've seen. I can't argue with you there. 
But hey, it's Isaac's was class and he knows how to handle his students, so I'm not too worried about it. The exercise went on for another 15 minutes before the job was done, and surprisingly, the two pro heroes didn't have much to say about the group's effort. Once the final review was out of the way, everyone began making their way over to the shipwreck zone to try their hand at aquatic rescues. Once everything was all said and done, the classes reconvened back at the water fountain to discuss how their training went and what they could improve on. For the most part, everyone seemed to be in good spirits, except for Sadu and Kamakiri who were completely drenched in water, presumably from their time in the shipwreck zone. You all did an excellent job today 13 praised the students in a jovial tone. This may have been your first exercise, but you all managed to impress me. Thank you, Sensei. A few students echoed. Please remember that rescue work is a vital part of being a hero and that once you get your licenses y'all have to deal with some much bigger obstacles. Here in the USJ we have the luxury of being in a controlled environment. But out in the real world things can get quite chaotic. The next time that you guys are here, we'll be throwing some more curveballs balls at you. That's reassuring. Kaminari rolled his eyes sarcastically before receiving an elbow to the ribs courtesy of Gyro. Do you three have any input the space hero motined over to their colleagues? Everything went well with my group minus a few mishaps. You all worked rationally and efficiently, Aizawa flatly stated. Other than some communication errors, I don't have anything to say to group B that they shouldn't already be aware of. Can followed. My group performed wonderfully all my cheered. Your teamwork and execution was excellent and you all managed to avoid any major mishaps. Top marks all around. Yeah, with Midoriya and Yanagi there it was a piece of cake. The shipwreck zone would've been way harder to deal with if those two weren't backing us up. Subiraba joked. Yeah, same for us. Rin added from his spot next to Shoji. Takagesen and Shazakisen were a major help. Our group performed rather exceptionally if I do say so myself. Monoma interjected in a slightly smug tone. With myself and Yei Orizusen, it was only natural that we took care of business. Was that before or after Sadosen and Kamakirakun decided to take a swim in the shipwreck zone Honuki shot back with a quick laugh. Bite me. Honuki the razor sharp user gave the boy an irritated scowl as he continued to dry himself off with a towel that Yeyorazu provided him. All right, save the jokes for after we get back to the classroom, Kan said in a stern voice. Everyone get back onto the buses so we can release you all for the day. Yes sir, the students all said in unison before making their way out of the building. Once the students were back at the main campus and finished showering, Class 1B was patiently waiting for their teacher to finish what he had to say so that they could leave. Once again, I'd like to commend you all on a job well done today. The man started. Before you leave, I need to talk to you all about something that I forgot to mention this morning. The end of semester exams. Damn, I completely forgot about that. A waste cursed under his breath. They may be two weeks away, but you all need to stay sharp. Of course, you have the written exams to worry about, but the practical portion is no joke. Use this time to fine-tune your skills and hit the books. Those who fail either want like what will happen to them. A collective shiver went down the spines of the 1B students at that last warning. None of them planned on failing to begin with, but now they had just a little more motivation to keep their heads above the water. That will be all, have a good day, Can said before exiting the classroom. Damn, with all the excitement I completely spaced out on exams. Tetsu Tetsu clicked his teeth. Seriously, with how much we've already gotten done this semester we've barely had enough time to really hit the books. Shota added, It's hard to believe that we're over halfway done with the second season already. Fukudashi's thought bubble spelled out as the boy packed his bag. Hey, I'm not too worried about the exams. Takage smirked. Everything else has been pretty easy so far. Now it was Honuki's turn to throw in his two cents. I still can't believe that you have the best grades in class. You know, you're deceptively smart for someone so laid back. What can I say? Him more than just a gorgeous face. The girl shot him a toothy smirk with a flip of her hair. Still, I wonder what the practical exam is going to be Midoriya wondered out loud. Deciding to let the others in on the secret, Kendu gave the boy a reassuring smile as she made her way over to the group. I wouldn't worry about it too much. My neighbor Tamaki is a third year and he told me that we're going to be fighting those robots from the entrance exam again. So it should be a piece of cake. Seriously? That's all Yanagi asked. Man, that's such a relief. The steel quirk user sighed. Fighting those robots should be no sweat. Don't get too comfortable, metalhead. If anything, you should be worried about the written exams. I mean, Pony has a higher class ranking than you in Japanese isn't even her first language. A green-haired girl joked, unintentionally destroying the rest of her longtime friend's confidence. Math is a language universal the horned girl cheered out. Still though, we're all gonna have to hit the books pretty hard. With how much we focus on our heroics classes the rest of it is left up to us half the time. I agree. I'm still having some misgivings about hero art history. Shizaki nodded. Suddenly a light bulb went off over Takage's head. A deviously brilliant idea formed in her mind that would enable her to kill two birds with one stone. Oh I know, we should all study together before the exams. What everyone looked to her. Think about it. If we all get together for some study sessions then we can piggyback off of each other and pick up the slack. That's not a bad idea. Tendu rubbed her chin in thought. Yeah, with Midoriya, Juzo and Itsuka there it would help out a ton. The steel quirk user agreed. It still won't be much help with the practical exam. 
but for that well I'll pretty much be on our own anyway. The green-haired girl added, well I'm all for it. What about you guys? Honuki looked to the rest of the group. Kendu, Shizaki, Tsunotori and Yanagi all gave a series of approving nods at the idea. In times like this there were no real downsides to forming their own study groups. As a whole, the entire group was pretty well balanced in terms of academic ability, so the idea was easy to get behind. The only person who hesitated was Midoriya. What about you? Izuku Takage looked at the boy sitting quietly at his desk. Wait, you mean me too? He gazed at her curiously. Hell yeah, what? Did you think I wasn't going to invite you of all people? The girl smirked as she leaned forward on his desk and slightly invaded his personal space. A slight blush formed on his cheeks at the girl's close proximity. Uyun Shurike, we can iron out the details later, but for now I have to hurry and catch my train. He'll see you guys tomorrow. Kendu gave the other a quick wave before making her exit. Shortly followed by Yanagi, Shizaki, Honuki, and Tsunotori. You can go on without me, Metalhead. He'll catch up to you in a bit. Cool. Tetsu Tetsu shrugged as he grabbed his bag and took his leave, leaving the two greenettes alone in the classroom. Now that they were alone, Midoriya's heart rate elevated slightly as Takage sat down on top of his desk. The girl was giving him a devious smirk and he had a pretty good feeling as to what was on her mind. So have you decided yet? She asked in a slightly sultry tone. WL2 um. You know, you can say no. It won't hurt my feelings too much if you don't want to. The girl's voice shifted ever so slightly. Every instinct in Midoriya's body was telling him to leave as soon as possible. But a part of him knew that wasn't the right choice. It was bad enough that he was making the girl wait on his response. But he didn't want her to get the wrong idea about him. It's not that I don't w want to. It's just that thighs is cake into coming from out of nowhere. How so? I just never thought I've never really been in this kind of position before. Hey, I get it. She gave him an honest grin before leaning down a bit more. As long as we're being honest, neither have I you're the first person I ever asked out, so we're kinda in the same boat. Wait, really he gave her a confused look. Yeah what, do you think I throw myself at every hot guy that catches my attention? And I know, of course not. Phew she pretended to wipe some imaginary sweat off her forehead. For a second there I thought you were under the impression that I was easy or something. I don't think that at all. He shook his head. Glad to hear it. Why me though that was certainly the million yen question. There were plenty of guys in their class alone who were much better options in his opinion. I already told you back when we left the orphanage. Like I said, it's not like I hide the fact that I find you attractive. Plus, I think we'd look really cute together. Oh, so, what do you say are you at least willing to give it a shot I promise the two of us will have a good time. And if you don't, then we can forget the entire thing ever happened. But, Midoriya's mind was split into two parts. On one hand, he was entirely opposed to the idea of going out on a date. Even though it still sounded completely insane for him of all people to do something like that. On the other, his nerves were getting the better of him. The boy only started actively interacting with people this year. His eyes suddenly shifted over to Takage who was looking at him with a slightly worried expression. If he were being honest, going out with the girl did actually sound like it would be fun. And it wouldn't be their first time hanging out alone. The previous times the two had some kind of outing, he enjoyed himself quite a bit. And even though she was a bit over the top at times, her personality was pretty refreshing and entertaining. And it certainly wasn't like he didn't find her attractive. There were more than a few times this year that he caught himself looking at her body for slightly too long, even though he would never admit to it out loud. Another few seconds of silence passed between the two before the boy mumbled something under his breath. What was that Taka asked as she detached her right ear and held it closer to his lips. A jig as we see could give it a ass shot. He nervously repeated in the same volume with a deep redness on his face. Really the girl smiled at him in disbelief. Yeah. On the outside, Takage managed to keep her composure while giving the boy a warm grin. But on the inside, oh, yeah that was definitely a yes score. Awesome Takage patted him on the shoulder. You had me worried there for a minute. I promise we'll have an awesome time, Green Bean. Okay, he'll text you later to work out the details, but for now I have to hurry up and catch my train. See you later, hot stuff, was all the girl said before quickly exiting the room, leaving Midoriya confused about her sudden retreat. A brief moment passed before the reality of the situation finally caught up to his brain. Oh my god, what did I just do? I just agreed to go out on a date. A date with a pretty girl is this really happening right now? Meanwhile in hallway, Takage was doing her best to bring down her heart rate. Holying shit he said yes I was almost certain he was gonna shoot me down. I thought I was gonna die in there with how nervous I was. That was way easier than what I imagined. After slapping herself in the face a couple of times and taking a deep breath, the green-haired girl regained her composure and made her way out of the building with a rather goofy smile on her face. The kind that made your face hurt if it was stuck in that position for too long. Now that she had that hurdle out of the way, it was time to begin phase two of her operation. Principal Nezis office. Two hours later. Thank you all for seeing me on such short notice. Detective Naomose Tsukachi addressed the group of five men sitting across the table from him. At the moment, himself, Principal Nezu, an older hero who goes by Gran Torino, Sir Naidai, Tashi Noriyagi and a young student by name of Mirio Tagata were all in attendance. It's no trouble at all, Tsukachikun. I assume that Tashinori has brought all of you up to speed on the situation. Somewhat, I'm still kind of in the dark about what's going on. 
The blonde-haired teen raised his hand. Tagata's confession was enough to elicit a slight scowl toward Yagi from the detective. I didn't want to worry the boy unless we had concrete information to work with. The emaciated blonde clasped his hands together. I guess that's fine. The black-haired man sighed out. To keep things simple, Tashinori had a rather interesting encounter the other day with one of the first-year students here at UA. A young boy by the name of Izuku Midoriya. Oh, you mean that first year with the telekinesis quirk that guy's pretty strong. I agree, Midoriya-kun is quite powerful indeed, said the unidentified mammal. So what's going on? On my way out of the school the other day, I ended up bumping into young Midoriya in one of the hallways. It was an ordinary encounter that wouldn't have meant much if he hadn't recognized me in this form. Yagi waved his hands around his emaciated body. Wait, what night I gave the man a shocked look. Are you certain of this? Without a doubt. Not only did he call me by hero name, but there was no mistaking the look in his eyes along with his reaction. How Gran Torino asked. I have no idea. You can't be serious you must run into this boy at some point before for him to recognize you outside of your hero form. Night I interjected. Gentlemen, for the sake of time let's keep the sidebar to a minimum and listen to what Tsukachikan has to say. Thank you, sir, the man said before handing out a pile of manila folders to everyone present. It took some time, but I was finally able to gather a decent amount of information on the young man in question. What do you have? Simply put, most of the information regarding Izuku Midoriya is rather unremarkable. He was born and raised here in Mustafu, currently lives with his mother. His dad is currently working in the U.S., and he's never gotten in trouble with the law. Him sensing a but coming. Tagata stated. But that's pretty much where the normal stuff ends. Explain. Let's start with school. First things first, Midwaria went to Aldera Middle School before attending UA. Coincidentally, another one of your students by the name of Katsuki Bakugu went there at the same time he did. Nothing out of the ordinary about that. I agree, but things suddenly changed when he stopped attending classes there part way through his final year. Go on. Please turn to page 6 in your files. The detective directed the group. As everyone followed the man's order, all of them stopped when they were met with a missing persons report that had a picture of the boy's face on it. A little over ten months before the start of the school year, Midoriya suddenly went missing for a period of three and a half weeks. Are you serious? Yes, the boy's mother filed that report a day after he didn't come home. There was a bulletin put out to the local precincts, but their investigation was less than thorough as it should have been. Why is that Gran Torino inquired? I suspect that it might have something to do with the boy's status during that time. His status. Read his description at the bottom of the page. Izuku Midoriya, age 14, green hair, green eyes, quirk non Yagi read the paper out loud. What? I see. Nezu frowned. Yes, I suspect that the police departments in the area didn't do their due diligence about this incident due to the fact that Midoriya was quirkless at the time. It wouldn't be the first time something like that happened. But that's a matter that we'll have to put on the back burner for now. That's terrible. Tagata grimaced and clenched his fist. I agree, but back to the matter at hand. Shortly after Midoriya suddenly showed up at his home three weeks after his disappearance, he and his mother updated his status in the Quirk Registry. Also, he was officially pulled out of his old middle school and attended online classes to finish out the rest of his compulsory education. I don't like this. A dark feeling washed over the Jet Quirk user's body. Nezusen, did this not bring up any alarms prior to him attending school here? UA, allows homeschooled children to apply just like any other. This year alone we had over three dozen participate in the entrance and recommendation exams. Also, we only do checks on possible criminal records, nothing more. So let me get this straight. Tagata began. Midoriya suddenly vanishes for almost a month and then miraculously shows back up with a powerful quirk. This is all for one written all over it. A silence fell over the group as the name of one of the most terrifying individuals in the history of Japan lingered in the air. With the recent incidents at the school and in Hasu, there was no doubt in their minds that the man in question was still alive. Let's not jump to conclusions yet Sasakisen. Nezu spoke. Sir, he's right, people developing quirks latest exactly unheard of. Gran Torino cut him off. But at 14 years old don't be ridiculous given the information that the detective has provided us, it's the only logical explanation. Tashinori, what are your impressions of this boy he's one of your students? Right. Young Midoriya is a rather quiet boy but a model student. From what I've seen he's not very social but he is one of the better students in my class. Yagi explained. Hadu said the same thing about him. According to her, he's pretty shy and jumpy. Tagoda added. His blue-haired friend had actually mentioned him quite a few times when they hung out. Has anything he's done stood out to you as odd? Yes. Please fill us in. There have been quite a few times this year when I've noticed him giving me some rather concerning looks during class. And he's made no attempt in hiding the possibility that I might not be his favorite person in the world. Of course I have no way of knowing what's going on inside that head of his. But it's quite disturbing. Deciding that he was through with everyone dancing around the subject, Night I slammed his hand on the table. We must bring this boy in for questioning and figure out what he knows obviously he has some connection to all for one and the more time he spends out in the open the bigger a threat he could become. What are you saying, sir? Think about Mirio, there was a break-in at the school not too long ago. It wouldn't be surprising if he was somehow involved in that. 
If he is working for all for one, then he might also have connections with the League. Sasakisan, please calm yourself, Nezu said. But, it would be a bad idea for us to try and interrogate a student based on speculation alone. As of this moment, we have no hard evidence for Tsukachikan to bring him in. Also, doing something so crass would possibly draw some unwanted attention. Like Tashinori-kun said, Midori-kun is a model student. He hasn't done anything to warrant such action. We are talking about the same boy who choked out another student during your sports festival, are we not? That's hardly a good enough reason to raise any suspicion. Listen, our best bet to solve this entire issue is for myself and Tsukachi to use our quirks on him to get some information. And how do you suppose we go about doing that having a police officer talk to him is already suspicious enough? But a hero with the quirk to see into the future is a major red flag. Maida held his tongue since he couldn't come up with an immediate answer. The hero decided to concede and leaned back in his chair. For now we're simply going to monitor Midori Akun and watch his actions. Since Tashinor Akun is his teacher, he'll have eyes on him more than anyone else. However, I will personally be talking to him myself sometime in the near future. Are you sure that's a good idea, Nezu? I don't see anything wrong with a principal deciding to have a simple chat with one of his more talented students. I agree with Nezusen. Talking to either myself or Nidai would cause some suspicion. Since the boy knows what Tashinora's true form looks like, it's reasonable to believe that he has a fair bit of information on him as well, including his associates. All right, Nidai folded his arms across his chest. In the meantime, Togatakun, can you do something for me? Sure, sir. I would like for you to try and get a bit more information on Midori Akun through Hadosan if at all possible. That friend of yours isn't exactly tight-lipped about things, so it shouldn't be an issue. The blonde-haired teen ran a hand through his hair as he thought about this request. To be honest, sir, it's a bit dishonest to do something like that. But since this situation is kind of serious, you'll see what I can do. Then we're all in agreement. For the time being, we're going to keep our distance and watch the boy closely. If any of you notice anything suspicious, update Suka Chicken immediately. Agreed. I'm still working the League of Villains case with the police. If he crosses paths with anyone of interest, he'll keep you posted. Meanwhile, he'll do some more digging on Midoriya and see what comes up. There are a few interesting things that I've found that I want to look further into. The detective added. With nothing else left to say, the meeting between the group adjourned. As he was making his way out the building, Yagi still couldn't help the nagging feeling in the back of his head. Something about that boy seemed familiar, but still couldn't quite put his finger on it. What's your story, young Midoriya? Said it was a summer affair for the students of the UA. Here, of course. Particularly for the members of 1A. For the most part, they had managed to keep their minds off of the death of Tenya Ida. However, once the day of the funeral came around, there was no hiding how distraught they all were. As expected, Class 1B also attended the ceremony to pay their respects. But most of them couldn't help but feel out of place amongst the mourners. This was especially true for both Midoriya and Takich. For Midoriya, he had never really had a conversation with Ida, so it felt a bit awkward to go to a memorial service for the taller boy. And for Takich, the only time she ever interacted with him was during the one-class rep meeting they had at the beginning of the semester. But today was not about them or their feelings on the matter. They were here for emotional support which also was a role that neither of them were familiar with. The ceremony was simple enough. The principal spoke, his did all might. Both of them talking about the importance of being a hero even as the community was hurting and about the type of person Ida was, as a loving son, brother, student, and friend. Once things were all said and done, the crowd broke apart. Some chose to leave, others stayed and talked to remember their fallen friend. Yuraka in particular looked as though she was moments away from breaking down, but Asui seemed to have that covered. However, there was one detail that Midoriya couldn't help but notice, and that was Bakuga's absence altogether. He doubted that the two of them were anything even close to friends, but it was still a bit odd that he didn't even bother to show up. Deciding not to dwell on it, the boy briefly said a few words to the Ada family and made his way home. He didn't really know how to operate in this situation, so he thought it was best for him to give everyone their time to grieve and heal their wounded hearts. Super friends. T-Rex how's everybody doing? Fist him good. Dumbbell pretty good. Skeleton hanging in there. Cross my heart is still a bit heavy from the ceremony. But him doing well. Though same. Skeleton I don't want to sound like that guy. But I felt super awkward being there. Dumbbell for real. Everyone around me was crying their eyes out and I had no idea what to do. Dumbbell does that make me a bad person? Fist I don't think so. Barely a few of us have ever talked to Edakon before. So it's understandable. Cross agreed. What matters is that we were there to pay our respects and support our fellow students. Ghost it was still incredibly awkward though. Apple yeah. Fist so would you decide to text all of us. T-Rex to see if we were still on for the study group. We didn't really come up with a plan before the weekend and we don't have a lot of time before exams. Dumbbells that reminds me. Dumbbell Awace wanted to join us since he's doing terrible in class. Is that okay with you guys? T-Rex fine with me. Skeleton the more the merrier. Fist him fine with it. Dumbbell cool. Yosu Awace has been added to the chat. Welding torch what's up? Dumbbell W-A-Z-Z-U-P. Skeleton W-A-Z-Z-Z-U-U-U-P. Welding torch W-H-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-
Cross agreed. T-Rex, now that the Bratribe has been reunited, let's get down to business. We need to come up with a date and time. Fist, how about this weekend? Fist, we can do whatever individual studying we need to over the week and then have a giant cram session so everything is fresh in our minds come exam day. Apple sounds good to me. T-Rex, how about set it around 13-0? Fist, sure. Skeleton, cool. Dumbbell, K. Okay. Cross, sure. Ghost, acceptable. Rabbit, okay. T-Rex, sweet, we can do it over at my place since we have enough space. Fist, your dad wouldn't mind. T-Rex Metalhead comes over all the time and he doesn't have a problem with it. And I'm sure that you guys are actually house trained. Dumbbell dude. T-Rex yeah I'll be alright. Fist alright. Said it said soon as house it is. T-Rex bring snacks I feel like we're going to be going at this for a while. Dumbbell I got chips. Welding torch I got drinks. Skeleton I can order us some pizzas. Ghost he'll bring some cookies. Fist all a man I was gonna do that. He'll figure out something else. Cross I shall bring a salad. Apple will have to think about it. Rabbit will bring some fruit and bagels. T-Rex don't worry Izuku, you don't have to bring anything since you're already a snack. Dumbbell that was so lame. Cross indeed. Fist at Suna, I envy your confidence sometimes. Skeleton will give it a 3 out of 5. Welding Torch how much you guys wanna bet that Midoriya just passed out. Ghost it was rather clever. He'll give her that. T-Rex thank you. Fist on that note, I have practice today at the dojo so I need to get going. He'll see you guys at school. Rabbit same. Apple me too. Ghost goodbye. Dumbbell yeah, I'm gonna go take a nap. Cross agreed, I hope all of you have. A splendid rest of your weekend. Welding torch deuces. T-Rex you people are no fun whatever, catch y'all at school. Once Monday came around, things pretty much went back to normal for the hero course hopefuls. They were scheduled. Could have another joint class with 1A today and the students were definitely looking forward to it. Will first year student, Izuku Midoriya please report to Principal Neza's office. I repeat, will Izuku Midoriya please report to Principal Neza's office. Wait, what Midoriya looked up at the sky in disbelief. Why would the principal call for him of all people? Geez Midoriya, what did you do away sassed across the classroom? Dude, are you in trouble in something? I knew it, it was only a matter of time before he was found out. Takage joked while dramatically shaking her head. Two don't know. All right class settle down midnight silence the students with a crack of her whip. Midoriya, it appears that you've been a very naughty boy. Hurry and report to the principal's office to receive your punishment. Oh, a few of the other students cooed with a bit of laughter. All right. The boy stood up from his seat and made his way out of the classroom. He had a strange feeling in his gut and his nerves were already starting to get the better of him. This was his first time ever being singled out like this. Whatever this was all about, it probably wasn't good. Barely ten minutes later, the green-haired boy found himself standing in front of the large wooden doors that served as the entrance into Neza's office. Midoriya gave one final uneasy gulp before placing his hand on the door and giving three forceful knocks. Come in the cheery voice of the unidentified mammal said from beyond the barrier. Midoriya did as he was instructed and shakily entered the room. There, he was met with the sight of the principal sitting comfortably at his desk. The man was stirring a cup of tea and had an unassuming smile on his face. Midoriya Kun, please have a seat. He motioned his paw to the open chair in front of him. Guys, assess sir. The boy nodded before doing as he was told. First things first Midoriya Kun, you are not in trouble. Really? Yes. Nezu reassured him. So what is this about then, sir? Midoriya Kun, is it that strange for the principal of such a fine institution like UA? To take an interest in one of his more talented students and have a simple chat over some tea. Talented Midoriya said in slight bewilderment. This was the first time he could recall anyone ever calling him such a word. I, I am really not all that much, sir. I disagree, Midoriya Kun. Based on the reports I've read and the training footage that I've seen, you seem to be quite the capable young man. You really give me too much credit. The boy bashfully rubbed the back of his head. Midoriya Kun, please, after being at this school for as many years as I have, you develop quite the eye for young hero prospects. The man continued, I wanted to talk to you for a bit and ask a few questions, if you don't mind. Oh, uh, Akazer. Excellent, he clapped his paws together. So Midoriya Kun, tell me a bit about yourself. I've already read over your student files, but those only tell part of the story. There's not a whole lot to tell, honestly. I'm a pretty average person. An average person with an above average quirk. He shot back. I'm not as well versed on telekinetic quirks as I would like to be. But even I know that possessing the ability to fly puts you in rather exclusive company. Yeah, I've been told that a few times. The boy answered. According to Katsuragi, only her, her sister, a retired hero in England and himself possess such a rare skill. Even one of our alumni, Fubuki Katsuragi has taken an interest in you. Both her and her older sister were very exceptional students. It's no wonder why she extended her hand out to you. I assume she's already talked to you about interning with her in the future. Yes, sir. How excellent. I guess so. Now, on to our next topic. While looking over your file, I noticed that you were homeschooled before attending UA. Yes, of course there is nothing wrong with that, I'm just curious. Your grades prior to leaving your old school were exceptional. You were even tied with second place amongst your class before leaving. That is true, sir. Coincidentally, the person that you tied with was another one of our more popular students, Katsuki Bakugu. Midori's entire body tensed ever so slightly. To the untrained eye, it wouldn't even have registered. 
But Nezabin, the intelligent being that he was, caught it almost instantly. Obviously there was something there that required further exploration. Yes, we used to be classmates. How interesting, two former colleagues ending up at the same hero school. Of course, something like this is not uncommon. I believe two of your own classmates, Tetsu 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 and Setsuna Takage also went to school together prior to enrolling at UA. Yes sir, they're good friends. What about you and Bakugakun were you two friends? No sir, Midoriya didn't even hesitate to give the answer. I thought that was the case. The man responded, given Bakugakun's rather abrasive personality, I doubt that he would have many people that were willing to call him themselves his friend. I agree sir, he's a bit rough around the edges. That's a fair assessment. He nodded before changing topics. In matters such as these it was best to keep the conversation flowing in different directions to keep a person on their toes. So tell me, Midoriya-kun, what was your reason for wanting to become a hero? I'm always interested in hearing about what motivates the youth of today to pursue such a dangerous career field. Well I guess the simple answer would be that I've always to help people sir. Midoriya answered honestly. That's pretty much what it boils down to. That's rather simple, but noble nonetheless. Most children these days have aspirations of fame and fortune. What are your thoughts on that? Midori racked his brain for a moment as tried to find the right words to convey his thoughts on the matter. Once he came up with what he felt was a suitable response, he had no trouble answering the man's question. He's not really in a position to judge others on their goals. As long as they do their jobs as heroes and protect people it doesn't really matter what their motives are. That's a very mature answer. Not really. Even so, being here at UA puts you right next to some rather famous heroes. Except for Eraserhead, Vlad King and Snipe, we have no shortage of well-known heroes amongst our staff. Why even the number one hero All Might is one of your teachers? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Midoriya's voice slightly tensed. Practically everyone is a fan of him and his work as the symbol of peace. Would it be too bold of me to assume that you're one as well? The slight bit of hesitation the boy gave was more than enough for Nezu to see that this was a hot-button topic for him. Honestly sir I, I've never really been a fan of his. I appreciate all that he's done for the country and his work as a hero. But he's just not the kind of person I look up to. Why is that? He's a bit too flashy for my taste. Don't get me wrong, he's a great hero and deserves all the praise that he's earned. But it's just not my cup of tea. It's rather interesting that someone who's grown up under All Might's influence has that view. He is the world-renowned symbol of peace after all. Wealth that title only means so much at the end of the day. Would care to explain. It's all really not my place to say. Midoriya sputtered a bit. Midoriya-kun, you have permission to speak freely. I'm actually very intrigued in what you have to say. Oh, where are my manners? Would you like a cup of tea? The man offered as he pulled out a second cup from behind the desk. Now that he had the boy right where he wanted him, the next step was to make him as comfortable as possible. Most people would've offered him a cup right out the gate, but he intentionally held off on doing so until this moment. Sure, sir. The boy agreed while he watched the principal pour him a fresh cup and hand it to him. He wasn't an expert on different types of tea, but this particular brand was rather soothing on the tongue. So, back to your earlier comment. All right. The boy nodded before setting the cup down on the table. In my opinion, sir, the idea of the symbol of peace was kind of flawed from the beginning. How so? I get that it's useful to help keep crime down and to act as a deterrent, but it's not feasible for the long term. All Might may be strong, but at the end of the day he's still just a man. And despite what people may think, he won't be around forever. Once he retires, I doubt that there will be anyone who can fill the hole that hell leave behind. And what do you think we should do when that particular day finally arrives? The boy was silent for a couple of seconds before giving his answer. I'd he say it's best to get a jump on things sooner rather than later. Start preparing now for when he's finally done. There are tons of heroes out there, so it doesn't make sense to put all of our eggs in one basket. I'm not an expert on architecture, but even I know that you can't support a house on one pillar. You seem to have thought about this quite a bit. And not really. The boy blushed slightly. It's just something that a person I know said to me once and it made a lot of sense. Understandable. The unidentified mammal folded his arms. I am curious though, if you don't look up to All Might. Then what hero do you want to be like everyone has someone that they try to emulate, even myself. I guess that would be Blizzard, sir. She's definitely the kind of hero that I won't be like if I ever go pro. Makes sense, you two have similar quirks and she doesn't have very much of a public presence. The only time she's ever seen on television is when she's on duty. The same was true for Tornado before her disappearance. Yeah, actually, this brings to my next topic that I wanted to discuss. Which is, like I said earlier, I took the liberty to review some of your training footage. And I couldn't help but get the feeling that you're not pushing yourself as much as other students. All Midoriya could do was give an awkward laugh at the accusation. Granted, it wasn't like he was wrong in saying so. I wouldn't say that exactly, sir. I always give it my all during class, it just so happens that my quirk is really convenient for most of what we've done here so far. I can agree with that. With your power, most battles would be over before they started. And given the fact that you can fly, very few students at this school present a real challenge for you. As of right now, I'd say that only a few third-year students could really give you a run for your money. Nejair Hadu is actually the first to come to mind. You two spend your lunches together on the roof if I'm not mistaken. 
Midoriya failed to hide the look of surprise that palstered itself onto his face at the mammal's words. Midoriya Kun, you should know that I have eyes and ears all over this school. It's not against the rules to spend your time up there. But I do find it odd that you chose to eat there and not with your classmates. Nezu said with a curious look. I, I am just not good with big crowds, sir. It's never really been my thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. The man answered before standing up from his seat and walking towards the open window. Well, Midori Kun, unfortunately that is all the time that we have for today. You have to get back to your studies after all. But I think I finally have a good idea on what kind of student you are. Oh, okay the boy stood up out of his own seat. I look forward to seeing how you progress during your time here at UA. I have high hopes for you and I'm sure you'll live up to my expectations. Thank you, Nezusan. Midoriya politely bowed. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Yes, sir. He bowed once again before turning on his heels and walking out of the room. As soon as the large wooden doors closed behind him, Tsukachi and Yagi popped out from behind the cracked open bathroom door near the back of the room. So Tsukachikun, did you get all of that? Nezu turned to the two men. Yes, for what it's worth the boy is a rather honest kid. The detective answered. Most of everything he said was true. Most Yagi gave him a concerned look. There were two instances where he lied. The first was when he said that he wasn't really in a position to judge others on their goals for becoming a hero. The second was when he said that he's never been a fan of All Might. That one practically broke by internal polygraph the moment the words came out of his mouth. Interesting. Nezu rubbed a paw to his chin. Coupling that with his thoughts concerning All Might, this paints quite an interesting picture. He was a fan of yours at some point Tashinora Kun, but now he's not. I wonder what made him change his mind. Yagi said to no one in particular. Did he do something to make the boy lose faith in him or was it something else? Well, his views are rather unique. Unique yes, but not unreasonable. The mammal thought to himself. In any case, I didn't feel the need to push the conversation any further than that point. Nothing else he said raised any major suspicions. At least none that he was comfortable with pointing out at the moment without some more information. I agree, Tsukachi added. For now we should just stick with our original plan and keep our distance. We were already pushing it with that interview of yours. Indeed, for the time being let's not do anything else so rash. Now then, Toshinora Kun, you have a class to instruct if I'm not mistaken. Yes sir. Yagi looked at his watch, seeing that he only had about 30 minutes before the first year's heroics lesson. He'll be on my way. Me too. He'll keep you up to date if something else comes up in my investigation. With that, the two men made their exits, leaving Nezu alone with his thoughts. After a brief moment of contemplation, the man walked over to his desk and sat himself down in his chair. Quite an interesting person indeed. So Midoriya, what the hell did the principal want to talk to you about Awase asked as the boys of 1B got changed into their hero costumes. Nothing really, he just wanted to pick my brain and ask me a few questions. Midoriya answered. Man, we totally thought that you were about to get expelled or something. Subiraba joked. Yeah it was pretty nerve wracking There's something scary about him. Seriously, I've heard that he's one of the most intelligent beings on the planet. That's definitely something to be freaked out about. Still though, what did you guys actually talk about Tetsu Tetsu inquired. He just wanted to know why I'm trying to become a hero. The boy said, he didn't really feel the need to fill the others and the rest of their conversation. Mainly because something about it made him uneasy. That's it a few boys said in unison. Yeah, ho. Oh. Alright guys, we better hurry up and get out there before we all get in trouble. Honuki the last week before exams of boys flew to make their way outside. outside. Finally I came am here to teach the voice Midoriya of all had my just finished up his finally morning arriving in the viewing room, moments striking away a dramatic from stepping out of the apartment. Pose. Despite so being well into their studies, and it was still pretty son. crazy was to most of the going over to a friend's house one hero for the first time in essentially forever. Today all of Even you will be engaging in a bit of friendly wasp competition. Exactly friends what do you mean? Sensei and Jiro ask. This was still a pretty big deal to in a three just for the game afternoon. Capture the flag. I won't be gone the too long. Began explaining. He answered. The rules okay, are pretty just simple. Make sure that you all call of you will form up into 13 teams of three and begin at various ends of the training ground. And you should probably take a jacket or something. black flag located on the tallest building and bring it back to your starting point. But decided to just hold his tongue as long as you don't use excessive force. He walked over, over to his room and no grabbed the white hoodie out of his closet before throwing it's it over like in his sports body. Festival. He didn't have a so rain jacket one big or poncho, for all. so this would have Waste to suffice. Commented. All that right, is correct, young boys. So He's where the team? That young Kiyoshima called out to him is just the fun as he part. Out. You will all yeah, have the luxury of choosing your own teams. He needed to get going or else he was going to miss his After that, you all head out and make your way to your starting points. He simply said fell over the room as everyone let those words Although she would never admit exercise like every time he walked out that door, a small bit of co fight with some of the other teams was practically unavoidable. And with all the chaos Going she around did her, her best to not hurry about hang the boy every flag time he left her sight. She knew that being a helicopter parent, parent wasn't a good partner, partner either. Was both powerful but considering and hard all they had been through recently, and there was, was one person not in particular that. who had With a guaranteed advantage over the competition. The woman released the tension in her Midori shoulders practically and quickly all got the one be staring her lunch in unison as they directed their attention that her son make it back to her in one piece. Oh no, a sense of dread washed over the boy's body as they all crowded around him. He expected something like this to happen. There were far less crowds this time of day as compared to during the week. Simon, dude, be my scrolling through his phone and letting out a short team up with Midori. Continued strolling down the street, street would be the residential neighborhood. Midori 
dress was leading said in haughty to. tone. It was a pretty normal of the suburban gaggle, community with decent sized houses their that pretty much plead all their cases the as to why nothing you wouldn't see anywhere team. else in Japan. It was plainly this obvious was his first that he was time going, going to be the one that everyone would go after. Since his early but considering the fact that his quirk was perfect for this, it was only logical. Not only was he intentionally going to a girl's house, but he would be spending a fair amount of time with his classmates. The orange-haired teen looked an eyebrow at her class that something like this would never happen. This is the perfect chance for me to finally go up against him since our battle trial. I've got a few new moves that I want to test out and head be the perfect three person to practice them on. on the door. The green haired girl about 15 seconds before the sound of, of footsteps well, could be heard from the other side. Why don't we partner up? We have sure a pretty good balance opened up of the real talkage. The only girl thing that relaxed in a rather form fitting sounds blue tank top and black gym grin widened. Her usually free flowing hair was tied up into a ponytail that certainly didn't help the fact that the gaggle showed no signs of trying not to blush. The green haired boy was about to try and make a break for it before a hand placed itself on his right shoulder. Wow, we're talking about punctuality. The girl smiled and the only one that can keep up with you and watch your back. I apologize. You know, I can stay by the late. way that didn't it's find any room come for on and you're the first one here. Who she waved off, boy, greeting him for some strange reason. Thank Although you. he couldn't argue with the girl's logic, once he was made way too much the boy quickly sense. removed the hell shoes and fair came the girl to snatch an accusatory he finger at the girl. It was just a simple container as filled with a sword and fruit and a bag of bagels. Seeing as, girl as they were gladly accepted on time, went over the gray haired girl to put an table. end to this knock. While she was doing that, the number of number between one and one residents. The person who rather nicely decorated home will be on our two out of the order. Everyone looked around at one another before nodding their heads and shouting out their bit more vibrant than when he saw. Which was understandable considering the girl's personality. As he made his way over to the living. Room. Kodai the held boy noticed two in her right hand family zero in her line the wall signifying the number 20 on them were various to nine. pictures of Dude, really honed the people of Yama and other members of Sorry. her family Solid Air Yuzu quickly apologized for his father. inappropriate However, outburst there was one Kodai photo that got stood out to him the most the emotionless the black hair the image of a woman was straight hell. moss it's green hair and matching eyes dressed in the firefighter's uniform everyone else go form your own groups he thought to himself before Takage made her presence known everyone should be here in a bit metal head over flat but he's supposed to lead a waste of the train station so they should be here soon the girl teams. said while flopping you, down on the couch and patting it's no the problem. open spot next the girl to her. Replied, oh, but cool. we need to hurry the answer while taking the seat. Um, so there's really no point in getting so what started without the others. others. I think you a simple strategy would be our best, our best bet. Yes, Seeing sure. as well have the air advantage. Relatively all we need to do is make sure that we're the first before Midori decided to try and break We can pretty much avoid everyone else after that. I agree. The boy replied, looking around the living room once again. the same team. The girl smiled pretty big target on our few years ago since it's closer to where my dad others tried to take us out before that. You sure have a lot of photos. What do you think we should do about that? Taking another Midori was still around for a moment as he Midnight went over his eyes and a lot of them Based too. on the teams yeah, that he could right see for me. She laughed before pointing at the other just groups were going to be there and woman in question accompanied but everyone by in the class had no type of advantage it was in this a family scenario. photo of the quartet However, and an it didn't take part. long before she's pretty much been with us for as long as I think I have an idea. Aunt Nimi used to babysit you're going to be the key factor when we were younger. He then turned towards the emotionless boy's head. Social attitude long normally dictated that he not themselves outside of their designated starting point. curiosity ended up getting the better of him at that moment. Most of the teams were pretty balanced in terms of strength and ability. Together, she but there were a few obvious him. groups no, that were full of heavy hitters. But not for Team lack of one, trying. Bakugo, huh. Siro, me and my sister have been Team trying to get those two together for a while now. Shishida. Really? Team 3 oh, sat in yeah. Kamakiri four years ago. Team and then we need to talk. Ashida, Nana, showed the woman with the rather serious expression. Expression. Onuki, the R rated heroine gave the green hair a green curious Bondo. look as she shifted seven in her seat on the sofa. Subiraba, it was Jairo. a nice Friday team afternoon in the Takage household. household. The three women were patiently Kiwaro, waiting for the resident Agitura. patriarch team to make Takage, his return from Kendu, work. Sunotori, What's wrong? Sweet Team 11 Mindus, Kaminari, Koda. Team 12 Kisara, Kayama, come out with it. Team 13 Yuraka, Kasui, Takoyama, 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 K
quiet. They knew they I've were going trying to for years careful. to get that man right, to fall for me, go. but nothing is looked to his partner. I've pulled out Without every trick I can beat. think of to get him to fall, but it's boys back in the two telekinesis I mean, users the hero for God's sake. Slowly this began shouldn't be happening. The only Everyone thing I have probably tried is just pinning him to rush to the flag, but they had other ideas. screamed as she covered her sister's strategy was rather out of character for all of her to be here. That didn't make it about less brilliant. Black-haired woman stood on her feet. They were going to let the other group fight each other and wear themselves out. Think of how jealous people would be if you told them one of the other teams were on their way back. Same roof as you. However, oh, they didn't the boys even get a chance to scope girls. out the competition what you see in any way. No offense, but the dead is exactly the most few hundred meters away from them. A loud explosion caught their attention. Aside from him being turned heads to see back, he grew barreling towards them with just so head of steam. And way he rejects my advance right on his tail. Damn it, Bakugo! He's like supposed to be heading towards the flag. I must overcome the blonde-haired boy in the air with no look of determination. The explosion quirkies are only had one thing on his mind. Both girls looked at each other for a moment before giving on another and stupid exercise could wait. In a rush, like he couldn't handle the rest. You mean it came on a smile that her two right nieces. now. The only yeah, thing that Dad's mattered to him life was settling pretty the score with this green hair. Long as we can remember, well, you were right. Get he would be good for He was going to try and come after worse us. Things in the Young world than having you I knew as a stepmom. But I here, you didn't little think rascals, the head try and do this right out of the gate. The boy sighing. Hoday, we start tonight. The girl Operations nodded before reaching into one of her underwear. pouches and handing something to him. We are not sticking with that name. Too bad his work completely lacks subtlety. This will be fun set to cheer. Really while Midori was all Midori could say look under his helmet as he activated yeah. his quirk. Yeah, Takage let on an amused side. She's absolutely head over heels for him. Unfortunately, Dad's a bit dense when it comes to things. There was no reason for Bash to be expecting what happened next. But she is determined to make it happen. It's hard to imagine Midnight Sensei of all people having trouble when it comes to Dave. The Ashen Blonde team was surprised and laughed at the thought of it. But didn't have a chance to make his next move before being pulled in the same direction. The only thing I did was my morning training. Barely before a couple I got of here. seconds later, the sounds boy was only a few meters away from training teammate. you do she asked. Let me go. Genuinely curious as no to what kind of regiment the boy had turned his attention towards Just a Kirishima morning run and some practice with boy then used his quirk to really lift the boat on the weekends. The air. I bet you what he did too, during their earlier exercise. smiled while very obviously the three together with Bakugou The boy was dressed in a white hoodie and a pair of khaki shorts that showed off just the right amount of his said in a very annoyed tone. Barely a second passed before I thought you. the plain face he growled at his partner. No, well, we certainly it's don't just want that you're wearing the same hoodie from back when we first she held her arm out and used her own quirk. Midoriya blushed slightly. As Baku Seeing his arm they were suddenly alone, moved there was no better time to talk to his opinion than to ask a what question the hell? that has Wait, been on her mind for a while. Wait, you can manipulate a person's so, body parts individually a sensitive topic for you. Girl. Not what exactly. we're doing all the I way out here back gauntlets. It's got his actual limbs. He answered, That's amazing. Doing looked something at him like that takes a ton of precision and fine control. Giving a shrug. I don't think yeah, I can even I do that. Manipulating so what have you been up to? He quickly changed topics. I learned topics. it during my internship. I actually woke up not too long ago. The person is I just wearing finished something having heavy like back you got oh, some cool. The girl they, replied. The girl was kind of just when another knock on the door caught their attention. Hodai waved her hand in front of the boy's face before he could start her way over to the small hallway leading into the living room. Once she opened the door, she was met with the sight of the ever emotionless face of the now already wasted small container. His homemade cookies boy held out his hand and revealed a tiny Hello. metal rod. The gray haired girl greeted her back. Code sorry, I'm late. My um, train got the size quirk. You don't worry about it. She brought Talk her hands waved together. together. Out of nowhere, the only the metal rod so expanded in oh, size to Yanagi about three and a half raised meters her eyebrow in after hearing Using this. his newfound knowledge that he gained from inside Katsuragi, planted the herself in the chair to the right the object object around the bodies of the three one Nor here early. She was tight enough to keep them in place. I actually just got not so much so that it would cause any injury. I just thought that it made sense that you now it was Yanagi's turn to ask the questions. Why is that? I learned to talk to you like each other so it only makes sense. You Almost think this will be enough to Midori's stop me? face Deku erupted into an angry shade of red at what the girl Not was implying. Not only did these extras have the audacity to, to clear up any misunderstandings, like but they had the nerve to hold Sorry, a conversation while doing it. The girl apologized. Besides, I guess I'm he was now the tired of looking at the it's boy fine. and getting so, yelled at. Are you doing Midori all right? Gently placed yeah, the group down on the ground. The boy answered, them. "Just make sure." She simply grin. stated, "With that small annoyance of situation during their training session, the girl made it a target to check up on her friend every now and then, just to make sure that he was doing okay." She was still on the fence about keeping silent about his secret. This is over. Seeing as there was no reason. The rest of the blow students, the whistle on the mat quickly kept their word. Up. After a brief long for the rest of the study group to find a show group managed everyone now present to make it to the floor. The group the girl levitating materials of her body around each other in the sunotory transporting ten to one and getting everything the trio started. of girls were right to avoid everyone's here. Everyone are we going to get started on first the green haired girl and get the hell out of classmates? Takage quickly grabbed everyone's worst one of her hands. She still had quite a bit left in the tank. But since Midori's team was nowhere in sight, she preferred getting this exercise done with sunotory rather than later. Everything. Teammates not to before way too long. Their early formation and leaving. What the about building? you guys? Every world didn't even make it a hundred meters away from their destination before Hunnigan. something flew All past three of them. Gave out a set of shrugs at the question. All three of them looked down really to see a rod in any sort. Team standing next to a giant cannon. Talkage smirked with her hands tucked in the process of producing.
producing another the other two echo shoji appeared to be playing a waste shot for a couple of envious stares that right lasted soon. for a full 10 I guess some of the other teams were waiting down, down below for another group to grab the flags just flat out started cackling doesn't matter they only have one shot to get us and they missed and then work our way up shrugged her free floating shoulders it's supposed to be the shortest exam out of all two girls agreed and spend the least amount of time for yeah you're sounds good another shot way said from what they could tell just get the ball much by themselves oh yeah that only indicator that someone was said before looking over small wall of ice about 200 meters on the right ask you about how halfway through your journey and anyway, made sure to keep an eye out for any the room teams. was now focused Most on the, the other girls were stuck on the ground so they didn't need to worry test. about them in the only problem was that team was nowhere in sight it has something where Mary Khan and Lena Chichin are the orange hair hero wonder it probably got attacked from Shizaki as soon as we started acquired. the race. The Xavier wouldn't Academy. surprise me if Wait, some of the other men were almost shot shouted down in this competition early. Much like you make sense. The Xavier as soon Academy as the words came out of the top hero school in the U.S., the group had their a number of cut off by some internationally recognized pro heroes from graduated below. from there. By sheer yeah, luck, the horn all of them managed to avoid getting it. Pretty cool. But that was the least of their worries. Who was starting to make spoke one of the pizzas? So how did you end up getting pacing down below? After my first year, many of us were standing in the middle of the road about 80 meters of our grades and performance. The group didn't have enough time to think before the second four years long stop. Was sent had option of coming Once here again, Russia. they were able Why to talk to Jack without getting father's parents. But now they were in the middle of a fight that they were hoping what it was to avoid. Like here well, talk explains shove why the flag you have a Japanese Kendi's last name. Take that thing and keep your distance. Man, I've always take care wanted of to visit America. Sure, trust I bet me, it's so I got this. From Japan. She flashed Wait, the orange hair no in particular. Smirk Their crime rate is pretty high, though, from what I've her body Only towards her opponents. Many people Down mention ground, that, but it's not as bad as you think. Flying the horn team retorted. The girl head on. America is 26 times larger than Japan in his class that he preferred not to fight if he could help it. It's very big in the way. Getting to that flag was going to be as easy as he can't have heroes like all my boys just show up anywhere. The girl explained. I never thought of it like herself over Kendu a larger area, area and used still, pieces it'd be pretty to nice to go over there at least once. In the blink of There's an eye, the boy was locked in on all like sides and barely Talk had time to react to stay away the girl from started her attack. Don't joke. take this personal. Why is that? Izuku. That's where all when the crazy people lie. Most wild stories in America come from there. Most wild stories in America come from there. I was hero there for a while after moving and she told me the people in that state are crazy. Your hands are hero and tetsu. Yeah, as he looked up and down, he noticed that he was truly surrounded on all sides. I think I've heard around it on all sides. Literia pointed out, I apologize, but I believe we should hurry and start studying. And if it wasn't for the fact that he was truly surrounded on all sides, of information in the middle of it, he was then he politely interjected just before he could snap yeah, himself out of right. his thoughts. Talkage One of Takage's fists Everyone nailed him on the right side of his turn to lesson out two. Out of instinct, in pretty he immediately sure went to guard that the side. exam is going not to be even covering him later. He was struck again in the back of his head. She's going after what we'll have to deal with his reading Damn, comprehension and helmet is harder than it looks. The group wasted no time in getting down to business. She knew enough about the boy's quirk to know that it was corner of his eye. Literia saw Yanagi use her poltergeist to lean as he had no hope of tackling this move head before also instead chose to launch himself further in the sky as fast as he could. Jason, you are not why getting are you away from me that easy to ask in a very curious tone. Yet yeah, the girl stoically answered as if it was the most guy. normal thing in the world. Going on, you don't know that. Decided no. to make her move. He replied. The poultry really, guys do this all the time. Hovered mix study made a lot easier. Man, straight for Kendu your guys' quirks are so convenient. From what she knew of the Away's Americans' and girl's abilities, abilities. she widened nearly as mobile as either herself and Literally activated his telekinesis and tried to follow the girls at a time. Both he wielded were being both objects occupied. in front of the his girl face. Got about the boy struggled the away as he attempted to write down a few simple and words and to dodge it. However, this small task proved to be, to be a lot more difficult than what court. he expected. Heist the girl After said, a few before seconds ripping of the flag from Kendis he took a look in his hand and grabbing it, he tried writing the English word for wind. Now complete, but what he got was time to enact part two scribble. of their strategy. Wow, that's way harder than the girl said in slightly boy higher tone of voice than what they were used to hearing from her. The girl answered for her. Yeah, green hair got the message. stuff than I am. I don't have nearly the same level of control as you of the group not at how you pulled out a sand full of miscellaneous objects from her pouch and tossed them on the ground while placing a hand on her own shoulder. With the stage now kind of like. Tetsu and Yanagi went curiously towards the girl's Same direction, with but their opponents totally hot on their heels. Onuki what happened next yeah, was well, definitely a sight to also behold. Metal. At the Back last in middle school, second, Yanagi suddenly on iron changed direction in the middle of class. Yanagi suddenly made a hard left turn, tail while at the same said time, in Kodai tone. made a mad dash for a nearby and it helps out with Unfortunately for Team 10, they failed to recognize this in time and were exactly where Midori wanted. The green-haired boy himself quickly changed directions and made a hard stop above the pile of enlarged to his diet. Maybe the hardness of his still was relevant to his diet. Nuts and washers. Three subjects, one quick breath, activated his inner super moves. Seven bagels and one shred of an eye. Takage, the students found themselves hard at work in the middle of studies. what can only be Onuki described as a tornado of houses. Onuki and Takage took the time to break plans that left them easily no room to move. And everyone else shouted in the gaps whenever possible. To avoid a few everything was going bolts. smoothly for the However, group of students partners and everyone so was making good progress. In the progress. middle of the chaos, Midoriya found himself got enjoying this meeting of the minds quite a bit. It was his first time ever hanging out with a group of people before. Kendu to the ground with a couple of nuts. At least one that didn't make it a point to use him as a practice dummy for their quirks. And he could feel the nervousness fade away as time went on. Without a moment's hesitation, the group decided to 
to take a break to give their brains some time to cool off. Tetsu Tetsu was the first to run to the kitchen and start bringing out the rest of the food that everyone lizard tail to the litter user angrily waved her fist in the air. With the flag now in their possession that no one came to mind. The only thing that teammates had left to do was to secure their victory. The full swing until the sound of the front door opening drew their attention. That was one of Tornado's moves. Wasuki and Tarnie looked to the board. Everyone turned their heads and were met with the sight of a slim, average grin. He gave her a slight-sized man with short blue hair. Black eyes wearing a pair of blue jeans along with a black sweater. It's not perfected yet, but I have a decent handle on it. Judging by the fact that his face was on several photos plastered across the house, the students recognized this as Yanagi's father. With Yanagi's level of control over her court, he wouldn't be surprised if she mastered it in no time. He probably couldn't do it on that level with notebooks. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point all across the living room. She shot laptops, and with hair starting to point
With the, the boy dishes was no washed and the rest of the cleaning now done, compared to what he had gone through for most of his life, it was a far cry away from truly making still the him weekend. uncomfortable. He didn't want his Lost mom to worry about him any more than what yes, she usually not does really when anything more than that. And on top to of be that, honest, not he didn't want to overstay his welcome kind of seeing as the girl was about to have company over in a little while. You know you can just tell me to stop whenever you want. Thanks again for coming today. But I know you don't mean anything bad by it. Thank you for having me. But the last thing I want is to overstep my boundaries. I'll see you later, Izuku. Talk him one last hug before letting him girl shot back. As she watched him make his way down the street, you let me call you by your first name so it's only Fair remaining call person me by in mind. the house leaning you can up against the honorific too. I see could the board that can and you will. Telling me about I think we're good enough friends by this point for you to stop being so formal with me. Well, there was that word again turned around to meet his No case. matter how many he times he like heard a nice it, young it was still weird I for approve. someone to open How long have you been standing there? Naturally enough, because of his he answered nonchalantly. No one ever wanted to have anything to do with him. glad that you better taste in boys than fence about whether or not the rest of his classmates would think about what kind guys Nana was talking to while she's away at school. But he had been working on not being so not to end up like her. Yeah, I guess you're right. And it's not like you haven't already told me a couple of hours about yourself. Making accusatory of I haven't really told you any of my secrets. Sounds yet, great. The girl flashed a finger to her chin with a thoughtful expression. It had been a few expression. days since the you two don't of them were able to sit like down and eat together. The girl so she was really looking just to be forward to it. And going to and tell you one of my secrets so we can be even. Favorite dish was you just don't. Icing my on big secret ice was that I was, was all the man really said nervous about turning around and heading over to the kitchen. Really, the boy tilted his head in confusion. Two of them along with Kayama sat down for a very lovely family dinner. Was got to catch up on what was going on in their lives. I was like sixty percent sure that you were going to best shoot me down. Seriously, he said. Three grueling days of testing. The students were finally done with the red on the inside. I was super anxious. About in all, it. everyone wow. was feeling so there, pretty good about themselves. Now we both know at least one secret Somehow, about each all other. Of so we're even. Talk Talk a few close silence calls. was the only and response that the boy Talk received. Monoma, Talk Talk Shishida, I already told you to call me Satsuna. Didn't I? Didn't I won't be responding to anything else from now on. The way. All that but was left was for them to do was to make a turn to face him before placing her hands on his cheeks and grabbing his jaw. Oh come on, it's not that hard. Just say it with me, Satsuna. But as you all know, Satsuna the boy repeated after her with redness on his cheeks. All of you will be taking part in the practical Hearing him say her name immediately sent a wave of warmth all over the girl's body. As they that, all stood along with the main training in her chest. Do so while all the bad the teachers here showed us that what everyone weird. else seemed to better be talking. Better talk had smiled no at a few of you, did a bit of scouting. It was only after she finally looked up today to see what you were going to be up already in front of the station. We're fighting those robots this was from the entrance of the exam. Right Cam conversation with the world gave him a tight hug around his body was almost making her way over to cut loose and blow off some steam. Leaving to think about the last few seconds of their interaction. Actually, later, he tried not to dream about my beautiful face too much. For very reasons, this said in a low tone, this test will be completely different. My young Embarrassed about calling Wait, someone, what? let alone be a new focus on the exams for you. Once she was out of you sight, all the boy could do was shake his hand and do what he could to bring down his. So what does that mean for you? Students will be working in pairs. Definitely a strange girl. Opponents will be members of our esteemed faculty at times. But there was something about her that just couldn't help but make him feel all fuzzy inside. Deciding to push those thoughts aside for now, Midoriya walked over to his terminal to make the short journey back home. It was only after he boarded his train that he noticed the onward smile plastered over his freckled face. Ken Ben with Tetsu Tetsu versus Cementos. Takage and Kaibara vs. Ectoplasm. Subiraba and Kiriwaro vs. Midnight. Monoma and Honuki vs. Power Loader. Kamakiri and Shishida vs. Snipe. Shizaki and Fukudashi vs. 13. Sunotori and Kodai vs. Present Mike. Shota and Oase vs. Vlad King. Bondo and Kamori vs. Hound Dog. And finally, Midoriya and Yanagi will be paired up together. Ken finally announced. Midoriya let out a small sigh of relief after hearing that. Yanagi was the perfect partner to have for him. They had similar quirks and now that the girl had her support item, they had a pretty major advantage when it came to this exercise. However, one thing definitely didn't seem right about this situation. Practically all of the teachers minus Nezu himself had already been announced. Wait, the green-haired teen raised his hand and looked towards the principal. Does this mean that we're going to go up against you, sir? Oh no, we have something special planned for you two in particular. The unidentified mammal told him. What do you mean Yanagi inquired? For your exam, you two will be facing. The a very familiar female voice said from above. Everyone upturned their gazes and were absolutely shocked by what they saw. And Midoriya in particular felt a chill go down his spine. Green hair, green dress, white coat. Yup, there was absolutely no denying who this person was. Oh no, I'm sure that many of you know who she is already. But please, allow me to introduce you to the current 30th ranked hero and a graduate of this very institution. Our special instructor for the day, Blizzard Nezu announced with a smile on his face. Oh my god, it's really her Tetsu Tetsu almost shouted. Wow, her and Midoriya do look a lot alike. Kaibara whispered to Bondo and Kodai. Holy S. Tsuburaba's eyes nearly popped out of his head before shaking those thoughts away. F. Fubicus and Midoriya gawked at the woman who would serve as his opponent for the final exam. Out of everyone in the world that he did not want to go up against, she was certainly at the top of his list. Every advantage that he thought he had going into this suddenly became irrelevant. 
the boy took a second to glance over at his partner, and judging by the look on her face, Yanagi must have been thinking the same thing as he was. Katsuragi quickly lowered herself back down to the ground and planted herself right in front of the two telekinetic students. The woman crossed her arms and shot both of them a confident smirk. Hello Midoriya-kun, it's nice to see that you're doing well. I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to this. I hope you make sure that this was worth the trip out here. Both Midori and Yanagi could practically feel the intimidating aura radiating off the green-haired heroine's body. If the teacher's goal was to match them up against the worst opponent possible, then they definitely succeeded. As the boy locked eyes with his mentor, only one thought came to his mind. Oh, and those are all the matchups I have for my class. Aizawa stated as he placed a stack of papers back into a manila folder. Currently the faculty of UA. As first year hero course were discussing the lineup for their upcoming new end of semester exam. Due to the changing of the times, they had all decided to switch things up for this year. A short smile came from the fury face of Nezu as he gave the nocturnal hero an approving nod. Yes, I agree with your reasoning. He'll be looking forward to that particular match due to the parties that will be involved. It's going to be a complete madhouse if you ask me. Snipe commented while twirling his empty pistol on his finger. Now, let us move on to 1B in their lineup. Yes, sir, said Ken. I pretty much have everything sorted out. However, there's one problem that I keep running into that I was hoping you all could assist me with. What is it? Kayama asked. Midoriya and Yanagi. The themed hero replied. Simply put, they pose the biggest obstacle. Because of how the exam is set up, they'll be able to pass with almost no issues that I can see. Now that Yanagi has the ability to fly with that new support item of hers, they both present a major problem for whatever opponent they'll be put up against. Just restrict them to staying on the ground. That's the most rational explanation, Aizawa said. I thought about that, but it wouldn't really be fair to them. None of the other students will have any restrictions on their quirks during their testing. I can agree with that. Majima nodded. This is an issue. Whether or not they are teamed up together, none of us really have a chance of even coming close to them if they stay airborne the entire time. The room was silent for a moment as the members of the faculty racked their brains for a possible solution. Like Khan had previously stated, it wouldn't really be fair to either student if they were to place an unnecessary restriction on their abilities. The purpose of the exam was to push the students to their limits and have them work around their shortcomings. And they very well couldn't do that if either of them were instructed to hold back. Why don't we just have all might fight the mectoplasm suggested? Unfortunately, we don't know how long my match will take. And the time limit on my hero form is now a little over one hour at the most. I'm not sure if he'll be able to do it. Yagi answered in a slightly defeated tone. All of a sudden, Nezu clapped his paws together and looked around the room. An action that told everyone present that he had cooked up something interesting. I believe I may have a solution to your problem, Kankun. After all, this exam will present us with quite the opportunity. Would you care to explain, sir? I suggest that we place both of these students on the same team and have them go up against someone who can match them in terms of ability. Him not following. Kayama gave him a confused look. I recently had a chat with Midoriya Kun concerning his quirk. Why the boy told me himself that he hasn't been able to push himself as much as the other students due to his abilities. Thirteen was the next to speak. He's got a point. That boy's quirk is incredibly convenient for the curriculum that we currently have in place for the first years. So what do you have in mind? Before the unidentified mammal gave his explanation he reached over the desk and started typing into the keypad on his phone. If the purpose of the new exam is to pit students against someone with whom they would have a disadvantage, why don't we do a bit of outsourcing for these two in fact? There is a former graduate of this very institution that would be the perfect person to ruffle their feathers a bit. Once he pressed the call button on the phone, the staff patiently waited as the dial tone cycled a couple of times before someone on the other side of the line answered. Blizzard Hero Agency, this is Lily speaking. How may we be of service to you? Hello mom, this is Principal Nezu of UA. Is Fubuki Katsuragi available to speak? We have a proposition for her that I believe she would be very interested in. Following the announcement of the exams and their rules, the students of 1B along with the teachers were ushered into the building and headed over to the main viewing room. There they were greeted with the majority of Class 1A. On top of that there were even a few staff members present that Takage had never seen before. From what they had been told a few minutes ago, since the teachers needed some time to rest up Midoriya and Yanaga's match was going to be first. Hello everyone. Kendu politely greeted the other Hero Course students. Greetings, Kendausen. Yeyurazu spoke. You guys already finished your exams, Taka jest. Yes, the raven-haired teen nodded. How'd everyone do? Who was fighting? It was Kirishima-kun, Todoraka-san and Bakugousen against All Might Sensei. Seriously a few 1B students echoed in surprise. They had to fight All Might. Yes, the class rep of 1A confirmed. Yeyurazu then went on to explain how because their class was now short one member, the final match needed to be adjusted to account for the extra person. Not that it really mattered in the end. How'd they get so lucky Tetsu Tetsu looked around for an answer. Lucky more like unfortunate. Gyro said. How'd they do? To put it simply was a complete and utter disaster. They got destroyed. That bad, Hotakage commented. 
Going up against the number one hero was already a tall order, and considering the three students that were involved, she had a pretty good idea of how that particular match might have gone down. Hey, at least we finally got to see Todoroki use his fire, even though it was pointless. Kaminari shrugged in a sad tone. Are you all about to start your exams? Yeyurazu asked. Yeah, Midori Kun and Yanajichin are the first ones up. Kendu replied. Who are they up against? Blizzard. More than a few heads turned around after hearing that. Blizzard was here that was certainly a surprise. Although she was pretty popular, it was a rare sight to see the woman outside of her job. Yeah, pretty crazy, huh? I don't think I've ever seen Blizzard fight before. One of the 1A students said. She's mainly works as a rescue hero, right? Yeah. Honuki nodded before turning to Takage. Takage-chan, you teamed up with Midori Akun during your internship, right? Is she any good in a fight? Definitely. The green-haired girl pondered for a moment as she thought back to their internships. Based on what she had seen, Blizzard was incredibly powerful. And she was also very adept with her quirk. It was hard to believe that she was known as the weaker half of Psychic Sisters. How do Midoriya's and Yanagisan stack up? asked the tailed student, Ajiro. I'm going to put it like this. She's like a combination of the two of them, but better. Damn. Yo, did they already start a female voice? asked from the nearby entrance. Everyone quickly turned their attention to the back of the room and were met with sight of two people that Takage immediately recognized. One was a muscular woman with black hair and purple eyes. The other was a slim woman wearing a black pantsuit along with a hair accessory in the shape of white tiger lily. Ember. Oh, hey lizardy how you been? Ozhana gave the girl a quick wave. You know them Tetsu Tetsu asked his friend. MHMM. The girl nodded. This is Ember and Lily, they both work over at Blizzard's agency. Ember's a fire rescue specialist and Lily is her assistant. Cool, so what are you guys doing here? The bus let us tag along so we could watch the match. Since Fubikison's a rescue specialist, we rarely ever get the chance to see her in an actual fight. And there was no way that we were going to miss out on this. Plus, I wanted to see if Midoriya-kun's gotten any stronger. The flame control user happily explained. Makes sense. This should prove to be quite an interesting affair. Lily interjected. Fubikusen hasn't had the chance to battle anyone anywhere near her level since Tatsumakusen's disappearance. And to my understanding, Midoriya-sen is quite strong. This reminds me of one of those battle mangas where the teacher and the student have their big showdown. No wait, it's totally like the little brother that has to prove himself to his big sister Ozhana gushed. See I'm not the only one that thinks they are related Honuki was quick to mention, earning a few laughs from his classmates. In any case, I'm sure we're in for one hell of a match. Midnight said as she joined the conversation. Given the quirks of those three, no doubt there will be a lot going on. Let's just hope that the rest of us can keep up. Izuku Midoriya and Ryaiko Yanagi, battle trial commenced the voice of the announcer rang through a partially decimated training ground beta. As soon as they were given the word, the two telekinetic students took off from the main gate and immediately ducked behind a nearby building. Seeing as they were the first ones up, they didn't have as much time to prepare as they would've liked. And considering who their opponent was, this just put them at an even greater disadvantage. So what are our chances of being able to completely avoid her? Yanagi asked her partner. Slim, Midoriya answered. For the two of them, their current strategy was rather simple. Because of all the buildings that lined the artificial environment, it provided them with enough cover to move around relatively undetected. So for right now, staying low was their best option. Even though it would have saved them a lot of time, moving through the air was too risky since it made the both of them sitting ducks. I doubt that Blizzard is going to come looking for us in this big of an area. I bet that she's waiting near the exit gate. I agree. The boy replied. At the very least, we can use this time to scout out the area and see what she might be planning. Hopefully we can get close to the gate before we run into her. With that, the two students spent the next few minutes moving through the area while avoiding any of the main roads. They may have had a significant amount of time to make it through this exam, but every last second counted in a scenario like this. Along the way, they took the time to go over their plan of attack in case they ran into their opponent. I don't get it. Why don't the two of them just fly straight to the gate said a confused Tetsu Tetsu. Use your brain, dude. If they do that then they'll be wide open for an attack. Takage looked to the silver-haired boy. Plus, they are probably looking to save energy. At the moment, the two of them along with Kendu, Shizaki, Fukudashi, and Kaibara were all huddled together in one group. That does make a lot of sense. Considering who they are up against, they can't get reckless. Moving stealthily is their best option. Kendu agreed. Roughly 10 minutes passed before Midoriya and Yanagi finally came within 300 meters of their destination. Up until now, they had seen no sign of Blizzard anywhere and the two couldn't help but feel a bit uneasy about that. After one last bound through a nearby alleyway, the duo ducked behind another building that gave them a clear view of the exit. Midoriya then poked his head around the corner and his heart nearly dropped into his stomach at what he saw. The exit was in clear view of where they were standing, however that was the least of their worries. Across the way, the boy could see a massive amount of debris conveniently placed in front of the gate. Random pipes, boulders, and other miscellaneous objects were completely blocking their escape. There was even a small car sitting atop the stack. Damn, the boy quietly clicked his teeth. What do you see? Yanagi asked in a slightly worried expression. Fubikusen blocked the gate with a bunch of debris. I'm pretty sure that I can move most of the junk, but it might take some time. 
We should be in range of your quirk. You can start moving it from here. You are right, but we still don't know where Fubicusin is, plus she knows the range of my quirk. As soon as I start moving stuff around, she'll know that we're close by. As much as I hate taking unnecessary risks, it can't be helped. Go ahead and start clearing that stuff out of the way and it'll be your lookout. Got it. The boy nodded. Midoriya poked his head around the corner once more and activated his quirk. The first object that he decided to move was the dilapidated car, seeing as it was the biggest singular piece that he could see. With a practiced ease, the boy lifted the vehicle from atop the mound and gently placed it next to a nearby bus prop across the clearing. Simply dropping it would have been easier, but the excess noise would only alert Blizzard of their presence sooner. Now that the car was out of the way, next up were the boulders. Just as the green-haired boy was about to start moving them, an unwanted guest made her appearance. Midoriya Kun, him disappointed. Didn't I already teach you how to move large clusters of debris Blizzard said from right above them? What the? Where did she? Without any warning, both Midoriya and Yanagi were lifted off of the ground and had their bodies flung up into the air. In the blink of an eye, the two were face to face with their opponent. Where did you come from? said Yanagi to the green-haired heroine. I've been tailing you for the last five minutes. Midoriya chose not to speak. Instead, the boy quickly looked around the area to find a way out of this situation. By a sheer stroke of luck, Yanagi was in his field of vision and the boy used his quirk to detach the folded hover disc from the harness on her back and used that to attack their opponent. Thankfully, Blizzard wasn't expecting such a move and momentarily broke her focus to avoid getting hit. Without missing a beat, Midoriya recalled the support item into his hand and then took control of his partner before she could hit the ground. The boy then grabbed her by the waist and flew off in the opposite direction. Sorry, I had to use your hover disc. He apologized as he handed the item back to her. Don't worry about it. Before either of them could say another word, a piece of scrap metal flew right past them. Midoriya looked back only to see Blizzard right on their tail, and the woman was rapidly closing the distance. Midoriya knew that in terms of speed, he was at a disadvantage. But because of how chaotic the terrain was, they had more than enough to work with. It looks like we can't avoid fighting her. Yeah, I figured. Inagi sighed. So what are we going to do? We're going to the ground, there is more than enough debris for us to use as ammo. Okay. The poltergeist user nodded. Just before Blizzard could close the distance, Midoriya took a hard left turn around a nearby building and disappeared from her vision. These compressed weights are really throwing me off. The green-haired heroine thought. I can't turn on a dime the way I want to because I have to manipulate all the excess weight. Once she was able to reorient herself, Blizzard quickly rounded the building and barely managed to dodge a few small boulders that were launched at her. The woman didn't even have a chance to look back before a second wave came flying at her. However, the psychokinesis user had no trouble in taking control of the objects herself. I believe these belong to you she smirked just before hurling the four decently sized boulders right back at her opponents. However, as soon as she looked down she noticed that Midoriya was the only one there. Or did. Bam a force nailed her right in her back. The impact was enough to cause the heroine to fly forward a good ten meters before she could recover. Blizzard then looked back to where Yanagi was floating on her support item. I'm impressed that you're able to move so quickly on that board of yours, Yanagisen. I remember Midoriya Kun telling me that he was going to teach one of his classmates my air surfing technique. The woman smiled. Instead of responding, Yanagi chose to put some more distance between the two of them. While at the same time, Midoriya made his move. The boy used his quirk to grab a hold of Blizzard and forced her to the earth and his partner used this opportunity to get back onto the ground. Now that she was on stable footing, Yanagi lifted up her hover disc and sent it flying towards their opponent. Barely a second before the object could make contact, Blizzard stopped at midair and turned it back on its user. Yanagi was somehow able to dodge the attack, but then the girl felt her body being pulled in the opposite direction. What happened next was the girl getting flung back to a nearby wall and having the wind knocked out of her. Yanagis and Midoriya called out, momentarily breaking his focus, which proved to be a costly mistake. In the blink of an eye, Blizzard was right in front of him. The boy flew backwards to try and put some distance between them. However, the woman's speed was just too great. Deciding to showcase a bit of her martial arts prowess, the green-haired heroine began assaulting him with a flurry of punches and kicks that were supplemented by her ability to move through the air. If it wasn't for the fact he was on the receiving end of this nonsense, Midoriya would have been impressed by the woman's skill. Ah, uh, I never pegged Blizzard for a scrapper, Shota commented, very impressed by the woman's fighting ability. And with her quirk, it makes her that much harder to hit. Honuki added as he watched the woman dance through the air. Towards the front of the room, Ozhana decided to put in her two cents. The boss makes it a point not to neglect hand-to-hand -hand combat training back at the agency. Every Friday, all of us who aren't on patrol duty spend a few hours in the morning sparring with each other. That's pretty cool, said Tsuburaba. Just because I'm a rescue specialist, that doesn't mean that I don't know how to brawl Blizzard taunted while continuing her barrage. By this point, both her and Midoriya were about 20 meters above the ground and she had no intention of letting up. If it wasn't for the fact that she had to manipulate the weights that were currently on her wrists and ankles, the woman would have been able to land a few good blows. Back down on the ground, Yanagi was able to catch her breath and got herself back in order. 
the girl looked up to see her partner ducking and dodging a flurry of punches and quickly saw an opportunity. The two of them were just within range of her quirk, and seeing as the woman was preoccupied, she wouldn't be expecting an attack from behind. The gray-haired teen used her poltergeist to grab hold of Blizzard's white jacket before yanking her away from her partner. Ah, oh, not bad the green-haired heroine smirked in her direction. Grabbing hold of my jacket was a good move, but a smart person would've attacked me while I was distracted. I wanted to, but she was too close to Midoriya-kun for me to do that. Inagi grimaced while taking control of her hover disc. Hilfer Blizzard shouted as she took control of the object herself and sent it flying into her left hand. Snatch Midoriya followed up by doing the exact same thing and ripping the hover disc from grip and taking control of it himself. Now that he had a moment to catch his breath, the boy sent the object flying back to its owner and Yanagi graciously accepted her gift. All right, that was a pretty good warm-up. But I think it's time we got serious. Don't you agree the woman smirked at her two opponents while ascending further up into the air. From behind him, the sound of crinkling metal caught Midoriya's attention. The boy looked back just in time to see the nearby light pole beginning to coil in on itself and was able to avoid getting flanked on his right side. While at the same time, Yanagi dodged a similar attack directed towards her. A part of Midoriya was hoping to conserve his energy, but that obviously wasn't going to happen considering who they were up against. Deciding to throw caution to the wind, the boy grabbed hold of Blizzard and used his quirk to send her flying away from the two of them and held her place. Head to the gate he shouted towards his partner as he took to the air. Right. The girl compiled before mounting her support item and joining him. As the two students made a mad dash towards the exit, they exceeded the distance on the boy's quirk and Blizzard was able to once again take control of her body. So far the woman was less than impressed with how they were faring. Although they were doing a good enough job so far in terms of working as a team, their reluctance to go head-to-head -head with her was a major problem. Based on the information that she was given prior to this exam, neither student was particularly aggressive in terms of combat and relied on their quirks to keep their opponents at bay. But such a strategy was definitely not going to work against her. I guess we're going to have to do something about that. The woman thought to herself before giving chase. I guess now we know why Blizzard was called in for this exam. Said Monoma. What do you mean Shoji inquired? Takage decided to be the one to fill in the gaps. Izuku and Ghosty try to avoid fighting if they can help it. They pretty much rely on their quirks to keep everyone at a distance. But they can't do that with Blizzard since they don't have the air advantage. A very astute observation, Takage kun Nezu smiled while sipping a cup of tea at the front of the room. Once the two students were at the exit gate, they took a quick moment to catch their breath. They knew this exam was not going to be easy, but they were literally up against someone who could counter everything that came her way. So what's the plan Yanagi asked? I don't want to sound pessimistic, but we're kind of in a bad spot right now. We obviously can't avoid fighting her, so our best option is to try and capture her. This area is littered with loose debris that either one of us could use, so our best bet right now is to try and overwhelm her. The boy replied, so what you're saying is that it's about to get chaotic over here. Unfortunately Midori aside, Inagi took a moment to survey the area. All around them were piles of loose rock and metal that definitely looked to be within her weight limit. She may not have had anywhere close to the range that Midoriya and Blizzard had, but at the very least she would be able to keep their opponent at a relatively comfortable distance. While the girl was busy thinking, Midoriya was doing much of the same. This entire clearing provided them with more than enough ammunition to keep their opponent on her toes. But that was only one part of the equation. They were going to have to create some type of opening that would not only keep the woman's mind preoccupied, but would also give them a chance to try and place the cuffs around her. Just as the gears began turning in his head, Yanagi tapped Midori on the shoulder to bring him out of his thoughts. She's here. Already the boy's eyes practically blew open behind his helmet once he got sight of Blizzard. Not only was the woman casually making her way towards them, but her entire body was surrounded by a sphere of floating debris and metal. Quick, Heidi grabbed his partner by the arm and the two ducked behind the bus prop. We need to distract her, Inagi stoically told him. You're right. He agreed before the light bulb went off over his head. Without any warning, the boy suddenly took off his green jacket and began undoing the straps on his vest. I have an idea. Back with Blizzard, the woman was cautiously approaching the clearing while keeping her eyes peeled. She wasn't dumb enough to underestimate her opponents. But at the same time she was certain that the two of them were going to try and catch her off guard. I'm glad that Nezusen is letting us use the same training ground that All Might was in during the last class exam. If he didn't take the liberty of trashing the entire place, I would've had to waste time ripping this stuff out of the ground myself. The woman said to herself from inside her protective bubble. Even though it was a solid defensive measure, the downside to using this technique was that she had to maintain her focus to keep it from falling apart. Once the green-haired heroine was about 100 meters away from the clearing, something caught her eye. From behind the prop bus, a green jacket suddenly appeared and dashed over to a nearby mound of rubble. Putting yourself out in the open like that, rookie mistake Midori Kun. She smirked before sending some decently sized pieces of scrap metal his way. Of course, she wasn't going to actually try and hit him, but she was definitely going to ruffle his feathers a bit. 
What Blizzard wasn't expecting, however, was for Midoriya to almost effortlessly dodge every single projectile that she sent his way. When hell did he learn to move so well she thought before regaining her focus and firing off another wave of debris at him. Unfortunately for her, that attack only yielded a similar result. Just when Blizzard was about to open her mouth, a certain voice caught her ear. Fubikusen, catch. With the Blizzard gawked in total disbelief as the remains of the crushed car came flying directly at her. The sudden surprise was enough for her to lose focus on her protective sphere and she was able to just avoid getting hit. But Midoriya wasn't done yet. After the car passed by her body, the boy quickly boomeranged it back in the opposite direction and sent it right back at her. Now that she had enough time to think, with a simple wave of her right hand, Blizzard grabbed hold of the vehicle and sent it careening into a nearby building. Right when she did that, Midoriya decided to make his move. The boy now dressed in nothing but his helmet and his long sleeve black t-shirt kicked himself into high gear and shot through the sky like a rocket. In response, the pro heroine descended just in time to avoid getting punched in the face. Now that she had time to recover, the woman used her psychokinesis to take control of her opponent and bring him face to face with her. Damn Midoriya cursed himself. I see so you used your coat and vest as a diversion to catch me off guard, not bad. She smiled at him, making sure to keep herself out of his field of vision. But word to the wise, when doing a sneak attack it's best not to shout at your opponent. Yeah, you're right. He said in a way that let her know that he was smirking underneath his mask. Something in the back of the woman's mind told her to turn around. And thankfully she did or else she wouldn't have been able to see part two of their plan. From down below, Yanagi made her move and launched herself into the sky directly towards them. Apparently the girl was a fast learner due to the fact that she imitated her earlier move and surrounded her body with multiple pieces of small debris. Once Blizzard was finally in range of her quirk, Yanagi threw every last piece of metal and rock that she was currently carrying directly at the woman. However, she wasn't expecting what happened next. Instead of trying to dodge, Blizzard moved Midoriya right in front of her and attempted to use him as a human shield. Inagi somehow recognized this at the very last second and was able to disperse the objects just in time to avoid hitting her partner. With both of them now caught off guard, Blizzard proceeded to throw the green-haired boy into the other student and force them down to the ground. She was able to disperse all of that debris so quickly this girl is good. He'll be taking that the woman then said before taking control of Yangi's hover disc and bringing it into her right hand. Blizzard then used her powers to destroy the object and separate into eight even sections. Damn it, said Yanagi in a very annoyed tone. Not only was her primary means of transportation taken away from her, it was just destroyed, meaning that she was going to have to pay another visit to Hatsune before she could get a new one. Using human shields isn't very heroic, Midoriya shouted up at the woman. The last time I checked, I was playing the role of a villain the woman shot back. Besides, I'm very disappointed with the way you two have been going about this. I was hoping that this would be a more entertaining fight, but I guess I was wrong. I've decided that I'm done going easy on you too. She said before launching all eight pieces of the now dismantled hover disc at the two of them. Midoriya didn't hesitate to grab onto Yanagi and launch himself into the air to avoid the attack. In response to this, Blizzard redirected the shards of metal to follow them. Over the next minute or so, Midoriya did everything in his power to avoid getting hit. Yanagi would have tried to grab hold of the pieces herself, but with the way that she was positioned she couldn't get see where they were coming from. Much like her partner, her quirk was limited to her field of vision. Take us behind that building. The gray-haired teen ordered. Got it. The boy replied after narrowly dodging another attack. Once they circled around the remains of the nearby structure, they took a brief second to catch their breath. We need to think of something. I know. You can't hide forever you two whenever you decide to come out, he'll be waiting Blizzard's voice taunted them in the distance. Midoriya's mind was racing as he tried to come up with a plan. So far everything they had done didn't work. They may have gotten close to victory a couple of times, but Blizzard's reaction speed was just too good. Unlike the two of them, the green-haired woman had experience when it came to fighting someone with a similar quirk. Come on Izuku, think Midoriya repeated to himself a few times inside of his head before a strategy finally formed in his mind. It was very risky and he was going to be putting himself directly in the line of fire. But if he was able to pull it off, Yanagi would have enough time to make her move. Alright, I have an idea. He then looked to the gray-haired teen. It's incredibly risky, but I should be able to buy you enough time. What is it? Man, this is getting good. Kamakiri smirked. I can barely keep up with all of this. Jairo folded her arms indignantly. Not only her, but a few of the other students were having difficulty following this match. Every few seconds this group would disappear outside the view of the cameras only to suddenly reappear somewhere else. This ain't looking too good. She's countering everything that they throw at her. Takage thought to herself. The girl was wearing a worried expression on her face and she was having a hard time figuring out how her friends were going to get out of this. Their means of escape was cut off and Blizzard wasn't giving them a chance to try and capture her. Suddenly, a hand placed itself on her shoulder and Lizard Tail Splitter user looked over to her orange-haired classmate. They'll be fine. Midori Kun strong and both of them are pretty smart. Kendu said in a reassuring tone of voice. Yeah, her right. The girl smirked before turning her attention back to the monitors. Above the clearing, Blizzard took this brief respite to catch her breath. 
In truth, the woman was starting to run out of energy to keep herself in the air. Under normal circumstances she would be able to keep herself airborne for a good 30 minutes before she needed to take a break. But with the added weight currently wrapped around her wrist and ankles, along with the fact she had been using her quirk nonstop, her limit was soon approaching. Deciding to just bite the bullet and conserve some of her stamina, the green-haired heroine descended back down to the earth and planted her feet on the ground. I really need to look into getting a pair of these weights for training. She thought to herself, barely a second later, something caught her eye. From behind the building, Midoriya and Yanagi suddenly appeared. Just like before, the boy was flying with the girl wrapped in his arm. However, they were sticking low to the ground. Right before Blizzard was able to grab hold of the two of them with her quirk something unexpected happened. From out of nowhere, Midoriya used his powers to launch Yanagi forward directly at her. This move was more than enough to cause the woman to dodge out of the way. With part one of their plan now in place, Midori used a brief moment to land the girl safely on the ground about 25 meters behind their opponent. A moment of silence passed as Blizzard cautiously eyed the two students on either side of her. It was plainly obvious to her that they were up to something. Soyu too finally decided to grow some spines, as she taunted. Instead of responding, Midori quickly undid the back latches on his helmet and removed the device from his head. Now that the thing was off, Yanagi was finally able to see just how much the boy was sweating underneath it. The girl herself was doing fine, she hadn't used her own quirk enough to elicit any of her normal headaches as of yet. But the fact that Midoriya was doing most of the heavy lifting didn't really sit well with her. Across the way, Midoriya began floating the helmet in his right hand and wasted no time in getting the party started. Without any warning, the green-haired boy launched the device directly at the woman, making sure to aim for her head. Just when Blizzard was about to take control of the object herself, it suddenly changed directions midair and she barely had enough time to dodge it. The psychokinesis user glanced over to her other target and everything became clear. She can move stuff on a dime like that she's good. Unfortunately for her, the woman didn't have the chance to think her way out of the situation before the helmet came flying at her once again. Each and every time the thing flew past her, the other student would take control of it and send it right back at her. A combination move it will be hard to grab that thing with the both of them slingshotting it back and forth like that. Looks like I have no choice but to go airborne again. The moment Blizzard's body started rising, Midoriya seized the opportunity and took control of her, forcing onto the ground. Yanagisen, go he shouted to his classmate. All the girl did was give a silent nod before taking the pair of cuffs from around her waist and sprinting towards Blizzard. With the way that she was positioned, the green-haired heroine couldn't see the girl rapidly approaching her from behind. But she could still hear her footsteps. Refusing to be outdone by a couple of high school students, Blizzard quickly searched around them for something to use. And by a sheer stroke of luck, about 50 meters away from them was one of the crushed light poles that she used earlier. Without delay, the woman grabbed hold of the large metal object and sent it flying directly for the group. Yanagi saw this out the corner of her eye and panicked, stopping her feet for just a second. Unfortunately for the duo, Midoriya did pretty much the same thing and broke his focus which was enough for Blizzard to make her move. Now that she was once again in control of her body, the woman released her hold on the light pole and held her hands out towards the two students. Pull she yelled in a commanding voice, forcing Midoriya and Yanaga's feet to leave the ground and collide into one another with a pair of loud groans. Now that the two were in position, the pro heroine launched herself up into the sky and activated her super move. Hellstorm. All around them, Midoriya and Yangi watched as every last piece of debris within a 7-5 to five meter radius of their bodies began violently rotating around them. And to make matters even worse, the circle was quickly shrinking. Damn Yanagi cursed, trying to think of a way out of this situation. With how fast the debris was moving, along with the fact that most of everything she could see was out of her weight limit, there was little that she could do. In Midoriya's mind, the boy was able to keep himself calm enough to try and counter the woman's attack. The boy cleared his mind and stood on his two feet, while activating his quirk. I hope this works. Hellstorm. Not only Yanagi, but everyone in the viewing area watched as the cluster of junk suddenly changed direction. At first it was moving clockwise and closing in, but now it was violently rotating counterclockwise and spreading out. In the air, Blizzard was certainly surprised by this. This was the first time in a while that someone had been able to counter her super move. Deciding to not be outdone by her own student, the woman doubled down on her concentration and pumped some more power into her quirk. In response to this, Midoriya mimicked the woman's actions and forced more power into his own quirk. With all the flying and moving that he had been doing so far, the boy was getting close to his limit. But now was not the time to back down. It was blatantly obvious to him that the reason Blizzard was chosen for this exam was to push him to his limit. And if that's what he was going to have to do to win, then so be it. On the ground next to his feet, Yanagi watched the boy put everything he had into stopping this attack. Due to Blizzard being outside of her range, along with the fact that she couldn't see her, there was pretty much nothing that the gray-haired teen could do right now. Him useless in this situation. The girl mentally scolded herself. I can't believe that he's giving me so much resistance. You are certainly powerful Midoriya Kun, he'll give you that. You two have put up a good fight, but now it's time to end this blizzard shouted in a triumphant tone before executing the finishing blow. Hellstorm Grand Burial. 
the cluster of debris once again became under her control and the woman put everything she had into trapping the two students. As the entrapment rapidly closed in on them, Midoriya decided to throw all caution to the wind and poured every last bit of power he had into breaking up this attack. He never really pushed his quirk to maximum output before due to the backlash it caused, the signs of which were now starting to make themselves known. The boy's head began throbbing and there was a slight trail of starting to leak from his nose. With one last push, Midwarya gave a rather dramatic war cry and a massive cloud of dust erupted in the clearing. At the same time, an invisible force pushed away everything within the immediate area and was not only to send Yanagi flying backwards, but was strong enough to push Blizzard back a few meters as well to avoid getting hit by some of the wayward debris. Once the dust finally settled, both women looked back to where the green-haired boy was still standing and were shocked by what they saw. What the hell is that Tetsu Tetsu shouted at what they were seeing on the screen? Well, a few others mumbled. On the screen everyone tried to make sense of what they were looking at. Not only was Midoriya somehow still standing after that move, but the boy looked different. The top of his hair was now standing straight up into the air and it looked as though his eyes were glowing. No one was sure if it was just the way that picture was showing up on the screen or something else. But they had certainly never seen this before. What the hell Takage thought? Dude, did Midoriya just go Super Saiyan or something? This is Lily quietly said to herself. Back in the training area, Blizzard seemed to be stunned for some reason. The cameras just so happened to be in good enough position to capture the look of pure shock on the woman's face as she looked down at Midoriya. What the hell she said to herself while trying to piece together what she was looking at. Something was not right, something was definitely not right about any of this. Her eyes had to have been playing tricks on her. The more she took in the sight of the boy, the more confused she got. The glowing green eyes, the floating hair. All of that mixed into a figure dressed in all black. Suddenly, images of a certain green-haired woman flashed across her mind and Blizzard felt a chill go down her spine. As high as he using overdrive. Down below, Midoriya couldn't exactly describe what exactly it was that he was feeling at this very moment. I was like a fog inside of his brain had just been lifted. For some reason his body felt almost weightless and the throbbing in his head had suddenly stopped. The boy looked around him to assess the damage that he had done and out the corner of his eye, he caught sight of Yanagi slowly standing back up. Yanagisen, are you okay? The boy said in a worried tone before flying over to where she was. However, something different. Whatever the heck was going on with his quirk right now, that momentary trip over to his partner was enough cause for alarm. Not only did he get there way faster than he expected, but moving through the air was suddenly way easier than it was before. Midori Kun the gray-haired teen looked up at her friend into his now glowing green eyes. What did you just- I don't know he cut her off. We can't worry about that right now. I don't really know what just happened, but Fubikusen stopped attacking us. The boy then pointed back up to where the green-haired heroine was gawking at them with a face of absolute bewilderment. What the hell is going on the girl said to herself before regaining her composure and standing back up. Now's our chance, we need to take her down. Right. He nodded with a slight grin on his face. Here's the plan. He'll bring her down to the ground, you get ready to put the cuffs on her when you see an opening. All right. The girl simply replied only moments before Midoriya launched himself into the sky towards Blizzard with an absolutely ridiculous amount of speed. Did he get faster? The sight of the green-haired teenager flying towards her was enough for Blizzard to shake herself out of her own thoughts just in time to avoid getting hit. Whatever was going on with this boy, she still needed to focus on this fight. She had expended quite a bit of stamina with that last move so she needed to end this once and for all. As Midori rounded back to try and make another pass at her, the woman attempted to grab hold of him once again. But just as she was about to do that, Midori suddenly changed directions and flew right under her. This speed, it's just like one etchens. The woman didn't even get a chance to react before she felt her body get forcefully yanked out of the sky and was sent flying towards the ground. At the last second, Blizzard was able to stop herself from falling and managed to hold herself up a few meters above the dirt. The woman then looked up above her only to see Midwaria floating in the air above. Another memory flashed through her head and something in Blizzard's mind clicked. Whatever was going on right now, the voice in the back of her head was telling her that it was going to be all or nothing. Blizzard then scanned the area around them and by a sheer stroke of luck, the bus prop was still in the same position as it was before, a good 250 meters away from them. That thing should be outside of his weight limit, but I can still move it. She told herself as she used her power to lift the vehicle off the ground and send it towards him. On a good day, she could lift two of those by herself if she pushed it. But with how low on energy she was right now, this was the most that she could manage. She may have gotten serious, but she still had enough wherewithal not to send the thing flying at him. At most she was hoping that the sight of the thing would be enough to make him move and lose his focus. The sound of the bus being lifted up was enough to draw Midoriya's attention. The boy then turned his head just in time to see the large vehicle approaching. Purely out of instinct, he attempted to use his quirk to stop the thing from hitting him. Midoriya simply held his hand out in front of him and much to the surprise of everyone watching, the bus stopped in its tracks. Holy shit he thought in disbelief. He stopped that an equally surprised Blizzard wondered. If she remembered correctly, the boy told her that something like this was right at the edge of his weight limit. He shouldn't have been able to move it so easily. Him not done yet, boy she then shouted before pushing the object towards him. In response, Midoriya used his own power to push back. 
Everyone watched as the two engaged in what could only be described as a game of reverse two before with each other, except instead of a rope, they were trying to send a bus towards the other. Blizzard was certainly not expecting this level of pushback from him at all. On her side, her head was starting to throb and she knew that she could only keep this up for a few more seconds at the most. Looking to find some way out of this, the woman quickly scanned the area around them in hopes of finding something to use as a weapon. But the second she averted her gaze, she lost a considerable amount of ground. Seeing as there was only one way out of this situation, Blizzard clenched her teeth and attempted to push her own quirk to its limit. All right, let do thigh. Click. What the? The sensation of metal wrapping around the woman's forearm was enough to break her concentration. With a loud crash, the bus fell to the ground and Blizzard looked down her at arm only to see a pair of cuffs dangling down from her limb. Utterly confused, the woman then looked to her right and was met with sight of Yanagi standing about 15 meters away with her hands extended outward. Blizzard has been captured. Team Midoriya and Yanni have passed the final the voice of the announcer boomed through the area. She snuck up behind me while I was focusing on Midoriya Kun Blizzard thought to herself. The woman had completely forgotten about her other opponent in all that chaos. I was going to do that sooner, but I was trying not to get hit by that bus. The poltergeist user stoically admitted. In reality, that was only half true. The girl was actually mesmerized by the display of power that she was witnessing and only just remembered the other part of their plan. We passed Midoriya set in disbelief while floating over to join them completely missing the peculiar look that the green-haired heroine was giving him. Yeah, somehow. Inagi breathed a slight sigh of relief. That was a good job you too. Yeah, you took advantage of my mistake and executed rather well. Blizzard stated, still not taking her eyes off of the boy. Thank you, Blizzardson. The gray-haired team bowed to the woman before turning the attention back to her friend. Midori Kun, what is that? What's what he tilted his head in confusion. Your look. Your eyes are glowing and your hair is standing up. What are you talking about? He asked before making his descent back down to the ground. The moment his feet hit the dirt, the boy deactivated his quirk and started walking over towards them. Yanagison, I think you are, the boy suddenly dropped to his knees and began clutching his head. Out of nowhere, a wave of pain washed over the boy's entire body. His nose began profusely bleeding, his head was pounding and it felt like someone just hit him in the back of the skull with a hammer. Midori Kun both women rushed to his aid, the two of them making it just in time to catch the boy from face planting into the dirt. He's out cold, Yanagi announced in a worried tone. What just happened? Is this the backlash from using overdrive it has to be? But how can he deciding to worry about that little detail later? The green-haired heroine grabbed hold of the boy and looked to the other student. Yanagison, head over to the front gate to get the medical bots and call for recovery girl. He drastically overused his quirk and won't be able to move for a while. Yes mom was all the girl said before sprinting towards the entrance to the training ground. While the girl was rushing over to get help, Blizzard looked back down at the unconscious teen that she was holding in her arms. A flurry of thoughts were flying through her head right now and a bunch of things just weren't adding up. There was no doubt in her mind that Midori had just used a technique that only her and her sister could use. And the current state that he was in was more than even further proof of that. What the hell is going on, Midori Kun? A very loud and dramatic sigh came from the mouth of Recovery Girl as the elderly woman stood up from her seat and began making her way to the exit. I was hoping that I could get some time to rest today, but I guess that was just wishful thinking. It looks like that boy went and overdid it. Around the room a slurry of sidebar conversations broke out amongst the students. Oh man, is Midoriya going to be okay? Tsunotori said in a very worried tone. I hope so. Honuki answered her. Dude, I don't think I've ever seen Midoriya go that hard before. That shit was crazy a waste blurted out. Yeah it did get kind of wild towards the end, didn't it? Ozhana chuckled, earning a slight nod from Lily. I knew Izuku was pretty powerful, but that was something else. Takage said, whatever it was that he just did, it certainly had Blizzard on her toes. Did you see her face earlier? Kendu asked no one in particular. Let that match be a motivator to the rest of you. If you want to pass, you're gonna have to put in the same amount of effort as those two can suddenly announced. Yes, sir. That's what I'd like to hear now that the first match is over, the rest of you better get ready. Kendu, Tetsu Tetsu, Takage, Kaibara, Tsunotori and Kodai, you lot are the first group. Start making your way over to your designated training grounds and get ready. A few quick nods were all that the themed hero got in response as the aforementioned students began leaving the room to head over to the exam sites. Along with Wei, Takage and Kaibara started going over their strategy again. They had done some planning before the first match, but there was nothing wrong with making sure that everything was good to go. You ready for this? The gyrate quirk user looked to his partner. You bet I am. We can't let Izuku and Ghosty steal all the glory now, can we? The girl beamed with confidence. Ectoplasm Sensei will be tough to deal with though. I know you are smart and all, but I'm a bit worried. Don't sweat it man, we got this in the bag. Alright well, I'm counting on you. He gave her a weak smile. With that, the duo began going over their plan of attack. They were up against a tough opponent and it certainly wasn't going to be a walk in the park. But Takage was confident that they would make it out of this with time to spare. Especially with the plan that she had cooked up. She was still worried about Midoriya, but this was not the time to think about that. Now was her chance to prove her worth and show everyone what she was made of. You better watch out, Sensei. 
or else you won't know what hit you. Setsuna Takage and Senkaibara. Battle trial commenced. The voice of the announcer rang through the building. Once they were given the word, the two students stealthily advanced through the building while making sure to avoid any open areas. Even though they were stuck inside of a large, circular building, there were still enough corners to work with. Deciding to play it safe, Takage immediately detached one of her eyes and used it to discreetly scout a few meters ahead of them. Over the last few weeks she had been able to work on her stamina to a point where detaching only one small part of her body could barely be considered an issue anymore. But considering who their opponent was, it was best to conserve as much energy as possible. What do you see Kaibara quietly whispered to his partner. Takage used her free floating eye to round another and take a look down at the lobby that lead onto the next hallway. There, she spotted two of Ectoplasm's clones wandering around the area. There are two down on the ground patrolling the lobby, but they are pretty spread out. We should be able to slip past them if we're quick enough. Okay. The boy nodded. Taka jammed her vision back down to the ground once again to figure out how she was going to time this maneuver. Once she felt confident about it, the girl quietly split her body up into five parts and grabbed onto Kaibara. The two teens then descended down to the main floor and silently slipped by the two clones without being seen. Once they were in the hallway, the two resumed their earlier formation. While Takage was acting as their eyes and ears, Kaibara was tasked with watching their backs. When it came to their exam in particular, they knew exactly why Ectoplasm was chosen as their opponent. For Kaibara, the boy's greatest strength was also his biggest weakness, and that was one in uncombat. As for Takage, her stamina was her biggest issue. The more opponents she had to fight, the longer it would take which would mean she would need to expend more energy as time went on. Another minute or two passed before the duo came across the next lobby on the other side of the hall. The second she poked her eye around the corner, Takage immediately yanked it back and pulled her partner close to the nearby wall. What is it the gyrate quirk user asked? Twenty of them, the girl explained. As far as she knew, Ectoplasm could create up to thirty clones of himself, and each of them shared a mind link with each other, which meant that whatever one saw, the rest did as well. They passed two of them along the way which meant that eight were either unaccounted for or not being used yet. The exit gate is on the other side of the lobby, right? So that means that his real body must be in here somewhere. Already one step ahead of the boy, Takage was surveying the area with her eye. In the area closest to the gate, one of the ectoplasms was remaining relatively still and simply watching the others. In her mind, it was a pretty safe bet that he was the original. He's barely inside the range of my quirk. We're probably only going to have one shot at this, so we'll need to be quick. The girl thought to herself before looking towards her partner. You remember the plan, right? Yeah, he nodded. Just make sure that you watch my back. With one final breath, the two set their strategy into motion. In a manner very unbefitting of his usually stoic and calm demeanor, Kaibara ran directly out into the open with Takage right behind him and immediately began taunting Ectoplasm. The pro hero was visibly thrown off by this for a few seconds before sending his clones to attack, which was exactly what Takage wanted. Without hesitation, Kaibara activated his quirk in both arms and both legs and began going to town on the clones. Fortunately for the black-haired boy, although there were a lot of them, they weren't very sturdy. He did feel bad about essentially ripping his teacher to shreds multiple times. But considering his current grade in math class, he pushed those feelings to the side. While that was going on, Takage had split her body up into 17 pieces and provided backup through the air. With her head floating high above the fight, the girl was able to give her partner enough time to keep himself from getting overwhelmed while at the same time, she was able to confirm her earlier suspicions. The ectoplasm that was closest to the exit gate hadn't moved, which told her that he must have been the real one. Unbeknownst to the pro hero, Takage was slowly moving one of her hands towards the exit. According to the rules of the exam, they just had to make it through the gate. They never specified exactly how much of them had to get past. Just as the girl's hand was about 7 meters away from her goal, ectoplasm activated his quirk once again and produced another clone from his mouth. Said clone then immediately swung his leg across its body and pulverized the girl's hand in one blow. The girl thought as she groaned in pain. It was just her luck that the part of her opponent's prosthetic limb that hit her body was the compressed weight that he was wearing. The impact was enough to literally crush the girl's hand under the weight and it she realized that she just lost the ability to use that part of her limb for the rest of the day. A valiant attempt, talkage. But these eyes see everything. Escaping will not be that easy. The clone quirk user looked up to the girl. Normally when someone's plan gets thwarted, they start panicking or complaining. But for some reason, a slightly manic grin formed on the green-haired girl's face and she started laughing like a madwoman. Sensei who the heck said that we were trying to escape we were just trying to confirm which of you was the real one. What? Kaibara? Now. Got it the boy responded. All of a sudden, the pieces of Takage's body that were still hovering next to the boy began violently rotating in the air and spreading out further and further with each passing second. This provided her partner with enough space to abandon his fight with the clones and make a beeline straight for his teacher. In response to this, Ectoplasm created another clone just in time to take a swing at the boy. However, Kaibara had enough wherewithal to power slide across the ground and dodge a prosthetic limb to the face. In one fluid motion, the gyrate quirk user got back up to his feet and tackled the teacher to the ground. 
Takage, I got him Kaibara shouted as he attempted to put the teacher in a submission hold. With the green light, the lizard tail splitter user sent her other hand flying forward and grabbed onto the teacher's leg. Takage remembered Kayama mentioning that ectoplasm's prosthetics were screw-ons earlier in the school year, which meant that they were easy to take off. As the rest of the clones converged on their position, the two students somehow managed to relive their math teacher of both of his artificial limbs in a matter of seconds. Never one to miss an opportunity, the girl quickly grabbed both of them and sent her hand a good 30 meters into the sky above. You won't be getting these back, Sensei the girl taunted with a confident smirk. The masked man didn't even get a chance to respond before Takage once again used her scale storm move to surround both her partner and her teacher. With the rest of the clones now out of the picture, Kaibara then activated his own quirk to twist the pro hero into an even more uncomfortable position. Once the boy had their opponent where he wanted him, he unhooked the cuffs on his belt and latched them onto the man's exposed wrist. Ectoplasm has been captured. Team Takage and Kaibara have passed the exam the voice of the announcer boomed through the training building. I can't believe we actually just did that, Kaibara said in a slightly shameful tone. That felt so wrong. What are you talking about? Dude, I think it went rather brilliantly if you ask me. Takage smirked while putting her body back together. Unfortunately for her, her right hand was no longer good so she would have to do without that for the rest of the day. That was a pretty bold gamble. Using misdirection, you made me assume that you were going for the exit gate when I was your target the entire time. And taking out my legs from under me was a good idea. The mask hero said to the two students. We know that you mainly fight using your legs, so it was the best option for us to go with. The girl explained, that doesn't make it any less ridiculous. The boy rebutted. All Takage did was laugh at Kaibara's obvious distaste for their plan. He was pretty against it when she first proposed the idea to him. But after a few minutes of pleading her case, she somehow got him to agree to it. Simon dude, all's fair in love and war. Besides, we were going up against a pro who can literally clone himself. We had to take any advantage that we could get. She patted him on the shoulder while still laughing about the entire situation. I feel solderty. In any case, congratulations. You two pass with flying colors. Ectoplasm interjected. All right, Takage cheered. Let's hurry back to the monitoring area so we can catch the rest of the matches. She continued before walking in the direction of the gate. Ah, Takage, can I get those back please? The pro hero pointed to his prosthetic limbs that the girl was still holding her left hand. Oh whoops, sorry sensei. She immediately apologized. The first thing that Midoriya noticed when the waking world demanded his attention was the slight aching sensation all over his body. His head was still throbbing and he had the vague feeling that someone ran over him with a car. The green-haired teen let out a soft groan as he made an attempt to push himself up, only to immediately fall back down onto the admittedly comfortable surface that he was apparently laying on top of. Whoa, easy there hot stuff. A familiar voice said to him in a teasing fashion. Midoriya finally opened his eyes, turned his head to the right and was met with the image of Takage and Yanagi sitting in a couple of chairs at his bedside. Both students were still in their hero costumes and had some relieved expressions on their faces. Ugh, what happened? He asked while rubbing the side of his face. You passed out after our match. Yanagi flatly stated. Really? Yeah. Takage answered. Apparently you overdid it with your quirk and conked out right after you guys won. Oh sorry. He apologized, more out of habit than anything else. It's fine. Are you guys okay? You're the one laying in the infirmary and you're asking us if we're okay man. You really are too nice for your own good. The green-haired girl teased. But since you asked, we're good. How'd your match go? We won. Of course the girl beamed while flashing him a thumbs up with her left hand. The small gesture was enough for the boy to notice that Takage was missing most of her other one. Evidently her test must have been pretty rough if she ended up losing part of her limb. Takage chin thought it was a good idea to take Ectoplasm Sensei's legs so that he couldn't fight anymore. Yanagi immediately interjected. What Midoriya almost yelled in response to hearing that. But knowing how Takage likes to operate, something like that was definitely expected from her. He'll tell you about it later. Anyways, how are you feeling? Tired, and my head still kind of hurts. Makes sense. If your quirk is anything like mine, overusing it results in headaches. The same thing happens to me if I go overboard. The poltergeist user said. Good to know. He left. Midoriya then took a second to look around the room. From what he could gather, he was in the infirmary back on the main campus. It was only his second time being there. But considering the abundance of medical supplies laying around, it was a safe assumption. On the other side of the room, there were three other students laying on the adjacent beds. Todoroki, Kirishima, and Bakugu were all silently sleeping. And all three of them looked to be in worse shape than he currently felt. What happened to them, the boy asked. It turns out that three of them had to go up against All Might for their exam. Takage explained. From what Yeyurazu told us, it wasn't pretty. Seriously, he stole another glance over to the three 1A boys. Having to go up against All Might must have been terrifying. He was the number one hero after all. Even if there were three of them, he doubted that they even stood a chance. He'll go get recovery girl and let her know that you're awake. She wanted to be notified as soon as you woke up. Hinagi said before standing up and making her way towards the door. Thanks. He gave her a quick smile. No problem. As Takage watched the small interaction, something about that piqued her interest. 
Over the last few weeks the two of them had been talking a lot more frequently than at the start of the year. Granted, neither one of them were particularly antisocial, relatively speaking. But she was curious as to when the two of them got so friendly with each other. On a regular day, Yanagi barely said more than 300 words to their other classmates. But whenever those two were around each other, they seemed to have full conversations. Deciding to push that thought aside for the time being, the green-haired girl turned her attention back to her friend. Your fight was pretty awesome to watch. I never knew that you could move a bus with your quirk. Normally I can't. He replied. I don't know why, but for some reason I was able to do it pretty easily. It probably has something to do with the whole floating hair and glowing eyes thing we saw. Oh yeah, Yanagison did mention something about that before I blacked out. He said, wondering what that was all about. So far as he could remember, nothing like that had ever happened to him before. All Takage did was shrug at that. It was still pretty cool though. If you ask me, you looked kinda hot. She teased, causing the boy to blush a bit. Only furthering his headache. T thanks. Ugh, an annoyed groan came from the other side of the room. Both teens turned their attention to the far side of the room where a certain ashen blonde teen was sitting up from his bed. Take your shitty flirting somewhere else. Some of us are trying to sleep you damn losers. Kinda weird of you to call us losers when you're the one who got totally washed in his exam. Takage immediately shot back, more out of a reaction than anything else. What the hell did you say to me Bakugu growled back. Hey don't be mad at the truth. Bakugu and Takage stared each other down for a few seconds before Midoriya placed his hand on her shoulder. The girl looked at him and recognized the expression on his face as one that said just let it go. All she did was give him a quick nod and quickly chose to ignore the boy. Did you win your fight? Deku Bakugu then asked Midoriya in an aggressive tone. What's it matter to you? Midoriya dryly responded, earning a weird look from the explosion quirk user. Instead of saying anything, all Bakugu did was let out a huffing sound and angrily stomped towards the entrance. Just as he opened the door to make his exit recovery girl, Yangi and Katsuragi were standing right in front of him. Bakugu, what are you doing out of bed? The healing heroine inquired in an annoyed tone. Bathroom, Bakugu stated before pushing past the three of them and heading down the hall, leaving everyone with a variety of different expressions plastered on their faces. Deciding to worry about it later, the three women entered the room and went right over to Midoriya's bed. How are you feeling, dearie? The elderly woman asked the boy. A slight headache, but I'm fine. Good to hear. Now that you're awake, I can give you one last look and you should be good to go. But y'all probably have to deal with that headache for the rest of the day. You went way overboard during your match and really messed yourself up. I highly recommend against doing something so reckless in the future. Yes, mom. The boy nodded. A few minutes passed as recovery girl gave Midoriya one final dose of her quirk before he was good to go. Naturally, even the minor portion of her power that she used left the boy a bit more sluggish than he was before. But the fact that his headache was already starting to subside was worth it. So what happened anyway? Things are still a bit fuzzy. Midoriya looked to the group. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Katsuragi interjected. How the boy turned his gaze over to the woman who was wearing a rather serious expression on her face. What you did out there during our fight, I'll put it in simple terms, was you breaking the natural limit that your body has on your quirk. What does that mean, Taka asked? I don't know if it could be considered the same thing. But me and my sister are able to use a similar technique. We called it overdrive. The woman explained. Overdrive Midoriya repeated in a curious tone. Yes, Katsuragi nodded. It's what happens when you push your quirk to its maximum output. However, this is the first time I've seen anyone else use it besides the two of us. Katsuragi seems to have a lot of knowledge about this kind of thing, so I'm going to let her be the one to explain it to you. Recovery Girl interjected. When it comes to telekinetic quirks, most of them work in a very particular way. Unlike most emitter-type quirks, they use two separate areas of the brain to operate. The parietal lobe and the cerebellum. Both of those areas require a significant amount of flow to function. When using quirks like ours, you slightly alter the amount that those parts of your brain take in. The green-haired heroine explained. That makes sense. Yanagi nodded. Obviously she didn't have anywhere the level of knowledge that Katsuragi had on the subject. But she remembered her dad saying something similar about her quirk. However when you overuse your quirk, your body tries to compensate for the increase in power by pulling from everywhere else. Typically, most of it goes to your head and can result in your vessels popping by the sudden increase in volume. That's why when you overdo it, you experience nosebleeds and headaches. And that's also why you're probably experiencing body aches and muscle soreness. I see, Midoriya said. Listen Midoriya-kun, I highly recommend that you refrain from doing that unless you are in an absolutely dire emergency. Sure, y'all get a significant increase in your power, but the backlash is too dangerous. The three times that I've done it, I was left bedridden for a few days. And the two times that I've seen my sister have to do it, she was out of commission for an entire week. If it wasn't for recovery girl here, you would be in much worse shape than what you are now. I understand. The boy was thankful that the woman was telling him this now. Otherwise he would have had to learn this on his own, which did not sound pleasant. Why he can even use that ability is still a mystery though. I get that our powers are similar, but I've never heard of anyone else with a telekinetic quirk that can do it. Then why was the effect on his body so similar to mine and one him starting to think that Osanachin's joke about us being related might have some merit? 
Katsuragi thought to herself, remembering the sight of the boy's glowing green eyes. It's hard to imagine Tornado having to do something like that. From what I've seen, she was already super powerful. Her having a power-up like that would make her unbeatable. Takage chimed in. The only time she ever used on the job was during the Kurob Dam incident a few years back. Doing that put her in the hospital for a week. Everyone in the room thought back to the event in question. It was roughly seven years ago when the largest dam in all of Japan had a hole blasted through it by some villains. Tornado, who was roughly 21 years old at the time, single-handedly held almost the entire dam in place for a good three hours before workers managed to get it fixed, averting what was sure to be a massive disaster if all that water got into the surrounding area. Subsequently, this was the same event that sent her hero career skyrocketing. So that's how she was able to do it, how young I said to no one in particular. The gray-haired girl remembered watching that event live on television when it happened with her mom. Tornado looked really cool back then. In any case, I just wanted to let you know the dangers of doing something like that. Activating it in and of itself is no small feat. But the longer you maintain it, the harder the crash will be. Thank you for telling me, Fubikusen. You are welcome. Katsugai replied with a warm smile. Now that we got the serious part out of the way, congratulations on passing. He'll admit that you caught me off guard out there, but don't let that take away from how well you two did. Thank you, Midoriya and Yangi said simultaneously. Unfortunately, I need to hurry and get going so I don't have as much time to talk as I would like. It's no problem. I expect you to keep up this level of improvement by the time your next internship opportunity rolls around. Don't forget that I still have first dibs on you, Midori-kun. Of course, the boy awkwardly chuckled. And Yanagisen, Katsugai then turned her gaze over the gray-haired girl. I was actually very impressed by you as well. Your level of control over your quirk is quite astounding. It took me a while to get my air surfing technique down and you seem to have a pretty good mastery over it in such a short time. Thank you. If you ever want to come and intern at my agency, my door is open. I'm always on the lookout for people with telekinetic quirks and I can tell that you have a lot of untapped potential. I'd be glad to have someone like you working alongside me in the future. A single blue eye widened at those words and for a moment it looked like the gray-haired girl was speechless. This may have been the first time Takage ever saw the girl show this level of emotion before. She was definitely going to put that in the save file for later. I'll keep that in mind, Blizzardson. Please, call me Fubuki. Katsuragi smiled. Well anyways, congratulations to you all of you once again and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. The three students bowed at the woman as she made her exit. You're good to go too young man. You all have the rest of the day off, so you can go ahead and get home. I want you to take it easy for the next few days. Which also means that I want you to refrain from using your quirk for the next two days at minimum. Like Katsuragi said, the backlash from your quirk puts a massive strain on your body. Recovery girl added on. Yes mom. It didn't take long before the trio of students made their way out of the infirmary and over to the locker rooms to get changed out of their hero costumes. After they were done with that and dropped their suitcases off back in the classroom, Yanagi split from the green-haired duo to go take care of something, leaving Midoriya and Takage to make the journey out of school by themselves. Now that they were finally alone, Takage wanted to make up for lost time and didn't hesitate to link arms with the telekinesis quirk user. For some reason, the act didn't leave him a blushing mess like it usually did which let the girl know that she was going to need to come up with some new material to get a reaction out of him. As the two turned onto the next hall to make their way out of the building, they were met with the sight of three bodies approaching them on the opposite end of the hall, and one of them was very familiar. Hey, Koai the bubbly voice of Nejair had to echo through the hallway, the blue-haired girl wasting no time leaving her two friends and literally zooming through the air towards them. Oh no, Midoriya silently gulped. This was his first time seeing the girl in almost a week and he had a pretty good idea of what was about to happen. How the Kinares be that big Takage thought at the sight of the girl in her hero costume. To say that Hattis outfit was eye-catching would be an understatement. It was a royal blue, skin-tight bodysuit with a high collar and pale mint-green markings covering her torso from over her shoulders to between her legs. Takage wasn't necessarily one to get jealous of another girl's body. But when faced with a literal bombshell like Hadu, it was hard not to. The girl herself wasn't exactly lacking in the physical department. She had a more slim and athletic figure as opposed to a curvy one like other girls. But standing in front of the blonette made her feel like a walking stick figure. Hey, hello, Hado senpai Midoriya nervously greeted the girl. Why haven't you called me yet? What both Greenettes said simultaneously. I left my number in that notebook of yours so that we can talk about quirks and stuff, didn't you see it? You did a very confused Midoriya tilted his head. Yeah, I left it on the back of the page. Is it so Takage deviously grinned at the boy? Apparently she wouldn't have to long for some new teasing material to pop up. Deciding to verify whether or not this information was true, the green-haired boy fished into his backpack and pulled out his hero notebook. He quickly turned to the back of the page and sure enough, there was a phone number written down on the top right-hand corner. I didn't even notice that. Damn Izuku, look at you. Takage teased. To um, oh hey, your girlfriend's here too. The blonette then looked to Takage before noticing that she was missing her hand. Whoa your hand, it's gone what happened are you okay? Him fine. The girl waved off with her nub. I lost it during our exam. It should be back in a few hours. 
That's so cool. So you can regrow lost limbs. How does that work? How long do they usually take to grow back? Does that work for every part of your body? Had who started firing off questions with stars in her eyes. It's a part of my quirk. I have a minor regeneration ability, but it's pretty slow. The girl answered, That's crazy. How are you so calm about this? I'd be freaking out if I had to walk around without a hand. It's happened before, so I'm kinda used to it. Takage smirked before once again linking arms with Midoriya and nestling up a bit closer to him than usual. Plus, I don't need to worry since I got a pretty capable pair of hands right here. The subtle innuendo was not lost on Midori at all and was enough for a decent amount of blush to form on the boy's freckled cheeks. Oh my god, you guys are so cute together and you're both green so it's like you match. Hadu, stop harassing the two of them. The boy with dark hair and pointed ears dressed in a white cloak quietly said from behind her. The group then turned their attention over to the two newcomers. In addition to the aforementioned student, the other was a taller and considerably more muscular boy with blonde hair and blue eyes. Jesus Christ, this guy's ripped talkage thought at the sight of the boy. She had never met him before, but something about him seemed vaguely familiar. And the guy's body was practically radiating an aura of power. Oh, but Tamakikan this is the guy that I was telling you about. The cute boy with the telekinesis quirk. Hadu groaned. I like her, she has good taste. Takage elbowed Midoriya jokingly. Ah, so you're the first year that Hadu keeps going on about the blonde teen chimed in and extended his hand out towards the two first year students. I'm Miryotagata, and this is Tamaki Amajiki. Hadu's a friend of ours. Nice to meet you, I'm Setsuna Takage, and this fluffball here is Izuku Midoriya. The girl decided to have a bit of fun with this and placed her left hand over his right, leading to a very awkward handshake. Whoops, sorry about that. The boy now identified as Tagata laughed at his little screw up. Don't sweat it. You know, I've heard quite a bit about you, Midoriya kun. The blonde-haired teen gave the boy a rather peculiar look. Mimidoriya pointed to himself. Yahadu here says that you two sometimes eat lunch together on the school roof, and that you're pretty strong. It took a second, but the boy's words finally clicked in Takage's mind. Wait, that's where you run off to during lunch the roof. Yeah, Midoriya admitted begrudgingly. Not even a full minute into this conversation and his secret of his lunchtime hideout spot had been blown. Wait, you didn't know Hadu popped out from behind Tagata. In Okoai, it's not good to keep secrets like that from your girlfriend. She does have a point. Takage's grin only widened as she milked this new information. Great, they are ganging up on me the boy internally groaned. Guys, we need to get going. Amajiki said in a voice that was barely above a whisper. For some reason, it looked as though he was hiding behind Tagata. Yeah, Tamaki's right. The blonde boy agreed. Sorry for bothering you guys. It's cool. Takage waved off. Ugg fine had to pouted while folding her arms. Although pout was probably a strong word. In reality, it had the same effect as if Marshmallow was trying to look tough. I'll see you later Kohai, don't forget to call me. Oh wait, I probably shouldn't say that in front of your girlfriend. That's kinda rude is to know hey, I know why don't you join us for lunch sometime so all of us can talk and have a good time I really wanna know more about your quirk. He'll think about it. Awesome anyways, have a good day you two was all the girl said before the three upperclassmen made their way down the hall and disappeared around the corner. Now that they were once again alone, they had time to absorb everything that happened. However, that moment was short-lived before Takage decided to keep the fun going, much to Midoriya's dismay. So Izuku, she dramatically turned her head towards the boy, giving a rather devious look. Yeah, tell me, are you a guy or an ass guy? How uh, the boy paled and nearly suffocated on his own saliva. Did he hear that right? Maybe he was still experiencing some of the side effects of overusing his quirk. Bingo. Simon dude, I gotta know. Especially if that's what I'm competing against. The girl motioned over to the corner where the three other students just were. I mean, did you see that girl in her costume she's got curves for days and then some. I don't really know how to respond to this. Simon man, everybody's got a preference. Well, two never really thought about it before. Don't give me that. You're a teenage guy, I find it hard to believe that you think about that kind of thing. W well what are you into the boy shot back for some reason. In times like this, it was best to change the topic as soon as possible. Unfortunately for him, Takage saw this as a golden opportunity to have a bit more fun at his expense. Well know that you ask. The girl adopted a slightly sultry tone and closed the distance between the two of them. If you really want to know she further egged on by walking two of her fingers up his chest. Him into guys who are good looking, nice, have freckles and get easily embarrassed. OMW well a now red-faced Midoriya stammered out. Suddenly, and completely ignoring the fact that they were standing in the middle of an empty hallway, Takage leaned in a bit further and wrapped her arms around the boy's neck. The girl then detached her head from her neck and brought it up to eye level. Once they were face to face with each other, Midoriya could feel his heart rate begin to skyrocket. He certainly didn't dislike being in such close proximity to the girl, but his natural instincts were telling him to pull away before he passed out. Sadamuro, the girl said, still holding her grin. Tomorrow the boy repeated. Our date. She clarified. Oh yeah, the two of them were supposed to go out on their first official date tomorrow. With all the craziness surrounding the exams, it almost slipped his mind. I'm really looking forward to it. Takage continued as she reattached her head to her body and released her hold on him. The girl then back away a couple of steps and placed her hands behind her back. Me too. Midoriya smiled at the girl. 
Glad to hear it. She smiled back before resuming their previous position from earlier and linking her arms with his own. Sorry about that, I know I can get a bit out of hand at times. She then apologized. It's fine, really. I actually don't mind it all that much. Good to hear. Before long, the green-haired duo exited the school grounds and made the journey over to the train station. Seeing as they got out of class way earlier than normal, and that they had the next few days off from school, the trip was a lot more relaxed than normal. So, do you always head up to the school roof during lunch? Taka asked. Yeah, pretty much. Why if you don't mind me asking? It's just something that I've always done. I just like getting some fresh air in between classes. Yeah, I can see that. The girl joked. And that Hadu girl is always there too. No. He shook his head. She kinda just pops up sometimes. Though she simply nodded and faced back forward before going quiet for a few seconds. Is something wrong? Said Suna. Nope. The girl lied. But hoping to throw the scent of her own trail, she quickly threw the heat back onto the boy. Saw since we still got a bit of time before we hit the station, I've been meaning to ask you something. What is it? Whenever we hang out, I'm always the one asking you stuff about your life. How come you never really ask me anything what? Are you not interested in me like that or something? No, it's not that at all. I just do not want to ask you personal stuff that you might not want to answer. See Izuku, I think by now it's pretty clear that I'm an open book. Plus, I always ask you stuff about yourself. To be honest, it feels kind of weird. Oh I never really thought about it like that. So, this is your chance. Ask me anything and I will answer with 100% complete honesty. The boy wasn't expecting to be put on the spot like this. As strange as it sounded, most of the questions that he had for the girl were rather plain. Like she said before, she was pretty much an open book. So did you have a lot of friends growing up was the question that he decided to ask for some odd reason. You seem like you were the popular type. Nope not at all. She answered without missing a beat. To be honest, the only friend I really had was Metalhead. Especially in middle school. Really? Yeah. She shrugged nonchalantly. Most of the other girls didn't want to hang out with me and the guys were kind of annoying. Why wouldn't they want to hang out with you I find that a bit hard to believe. Most of them were the super girly and stuck up type. And as you already know I'm definitely not. I don't really like being around those kinds of people. Plus they would get super jealous of me since I usually got the best grades in class and talked about me behind my back. That sucks. He said in an apologetic tone. And I'm guessing you were kinda in the same boat before you started the whole homeschool thing she inquired. Yeah, I guess you could say that. The boy admitted, thinking back to his less than stellar public school days. It sucks that you had to deal with that kind of stuff just because your quirk hadn't manifested yet. Of all the reasons not to talk to be friends with somebody, that's a pretty shitty one. That's just how it is nowadays. That doesn't make it any less ridiculous. She answered, sure, society revolved around quirks and people preached how you should treat everyone equally despite them. But when it came to quirkless people, none of that seemed to apply. I agree. Well, if you ask me, you're better off without those losers. All Midoriya could do was laugh at that statement. Yeah, I do like to think that too. It's too bad we didn't go to school together before this. I'm pretty sure the two of us would've been awesome friends. You think so? Hell yeah, I like to think that we balance each other out. You know, I have all the beauty, the brains, and the charming personality. While you have the adorable disposition. I don't think you can really call that balanced, Sitsuna the boy laughed. Well, I guess that's just a matter of perspective. Uh, but come on, don't tell me that those are some of my best qualities. Yeah, I guess they are some of the reasons why I like you so much. Midoriya's brain froze as soon as those words came out of his mouth. Did he really just admit that, out loud? He really needed to get home and rest up before he said something else that was even more embarrassing. Wow, a declaration of affection when did you get so bold and now slightly blushing Takage said in a teasing fashion. On the outside she managed to keep herself composed, but on the inside her heart rate had suddenly jumped. Yes, sorry. What's there to be sorry for nothing wrong with giving a girl a compliment every once in a while? In fact, you should do some more. He'll keep that in mind. He awkwardly laughed once again. Eventually, the two parted ways and got onto their individual trains home. Once he made it back to his apartment, Midoriya wasted no time in showering, eating and getting started on his extended weekend. Fortunately for the boy, today just so happened to be one of his scheduled video chats with his father. Izuku, how's it going how'd your exams go Hisashi Midoriya asked his son before taking a sip from his comically large cup of coffee. Pretty good. I passed everything, but I ended up overdoing it with my quirk during the practical portion. Are you okay the black-haired man with freckles asked in a concerned tone. Yeah, I'm fine. I just have to take it easy for the next few days. The boy explained. That's a relief. He let out a slightly dramatic sigh. So what's new anything exciting happened? Actually, there's something that I wanted to talk to you about. I could really use some advice the green-haired boy bashfully rubbed the back of his head. What about? It kinda meet be going on a date tomorrow. What? 